The Prefaces of the Odes and Carmen Seculare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Odes and Carmen Seculare by Horace. Translated by John Connington. Preface. I scarcely know what excuse I can offer for making public this attempt to translate the untranslatable. No one can be more convinced than I am that a really successful translator must be himself an original poet, and where the author translated happens to be one whose special characteristic is incommunicable grace of expression, the demand on the translator's powers would seem to be indefinitely increased. Yet the time appears to be gone by when men of great original gifts could find satisfaction in reproducing the thoughts and words of others, and the work, if done at all, must now be done by writers of inferior pretension. Among these, however, there are still degrees, and the experience which I have gained since I first adventured as a poetical translator has made me doubt whether I may not be ill-advised in resuming the experiment under any circumstances. Still, an experiment of this kind may have an advantage of its own, even when it is unsuccessful. It may serve as a piece of embodied criticism, showing what the experimenter conceived to be the conditions of success and may thus, to borrow Horace's own metaphor of the whetstone, impart to others a quality which it is itself without. Perhaps I may be allowed, for a few moments, to combine precept with example, and imitate my distinguished friend and colleague, Professor Arnold, in offering some counsels to the future translator of Horace's odes, referring at the same time by way of illustration to my own attempt. The first thing at which, as it seems to me, a Horatian translator ought to aim is some kind of metrical conformity to his original. Without this, we are in danger of losing not only the metrical, but the general effect of the Latin. We express ourselves in a different compass, and the character of the expression is altered accordingly. For instance, one of Horace's leading features is his occasional sentiousness. It is this, perhaps more than anything else, that has made him a storehouse of quotations. He condenses a general truth in few words, and thus makes his wisdom portable. Non si male nunc et olim sic eret. Nihil est ab omni parte beatum. Omnes iodem cogimur. These and similar expressions remain in the memory when other features of Horace's style, equally characteristic but less obvious, are forgotten. It is almost impossible for a translator to do justice to this sententious brevity unless the stanza in which he writes is in some sort analogous to the meter of Horace. If he chooses a longer and more diffuse measure, he will be apt to spoil the proverb by expansion, not to mention that much will often depend on the very position of the sentence in the stanza. Perhaps, in order to preserve these external peculiarities, it may be necessary to recast the expression, to substitute, in fact, one form of proverb for another but this is far preferable to retaining the words in a diluted form and so losing what gives them their character i cannot doubt then that it is necessary in translating an ode of horace to choose some analogous metre as little can i doubt that the translator of the odes should appropriate to each ode some particular metre as its own it may be true that horace himself does not invariably suit his metre to his subject the solemn alcaic is used for a poem in dispraise of serious thought and praise of wine. The Asclepiad stanza, in which Quintilus is lamented, is employed to describe the loves of Messenius and Lysimenia. But though this consideration may influence us in our choice of an English meter, it is no reason for not adhering to the one which we may have chosen. If we translate an alcaic and a sapphic ode into the same English measure, because the feeling in both appears to be the same, we are sure to sacrifice some important characteristics of the original in the case of one or the other, perhaps of both. It is better to try to make an English meter more flexible than to use two different English meters to represent two different aspects of one measure in Latin. I am sorry to say that I have myself deviated from this rule occasionally, under circumstances which I shall soon have to explain. But though I may perhaps succeed in showing that my offenses have not been serious, I believe the rule itself to be one of universal application, always honored in the observance, if not always equally dishonored in the breach. The question, what meters should be selected, 
is of course one of very great difficulty i can only explain what my own practice has been with some of the reasons which have influenced me in particular cases perhaps we may take milton's celebrated translation of the ode to pyrrha as a starting point there can be no doubt that to an english reader the metre chosen does give much of the effect of the original yet the resemblance depends rather on the length of the respective lines than on any similarity in the cadences but it is evident that he chose the iambic movement as the ordinary movement of english poetry and it is evident i think that in translating horace we shall be right in doing the same as a general rule anapaestic and other rhythms may be beautiful and appropriate in themselves but they cannot be manipulated so easily the stanzas with which they are associated bear no resemblance as stanzas to the stanzas of horace's odes i have then followed milton in appropriating the measure in question to the latin metre technically called the fourth asclepiad at the same time that i have substituted rhyme for blank verse believing rhyme to be an inferior artist's only chance of giving pleasure there still remains a question about the distribution of the rhymes which here as in most other cases i have chosen to make alternate successive rhymes have their advantages but they do not give the effect of interlinking which is so natural in a stanza the quatrain is reduced to two couplets and its unity is gone from the fourth to the third esculpiad the step is easy taking an english iambic line of ten syllables to represent the longer lines of the latin an english iambic line of six syllables to represent the shorter we see that the meter of horace's scriberis vario finds its representative in the meter of mr tennyson's dream of fair women my experience would lead me to believe the english meter to be quite capable in really skilful hands of preserving the effect of the latin though as i have said above the latin measure is employed by horace both for a threnody and for a love song the sapphic and the alcaic involve more difficult questions here however as in the escalpeid i believe we must be guided to some extent by external similarity we must choose the iambic movement as being most congenial to english we must avoid the ten-syllable iambic as already appropriated to the longer esculpiad line this leads me to conclude that the staple of each stanza should be the eight-syllable iambic a measure more familiar to english lyric poetry than any other and as such well adapted to represent the most familiar lyric measures of horace with regard to the sapphic it seems desirable that it should be represented by a measure of which the three first lines are eight syllable iambics the fourth some shorter variety of this stanza there are at least two kinds for which something might be said it might be constructed so that the three first lines should rhyme with each other the fourth being otherwise dealt with or it might be framed on the plan of alternate rhymes the fourth line still being shorter than the rest of the former kind two or three specimens are to be found in francis's translation of horace in these the fourth line consists of but three syllables the two last of which rhyme with the two last syllables of the fourth line of the next succeeding stanza as for instance you shoot she wets her tusks to bite while he who sits to judge the fight treads on the palm with foot so white disdainful and sweetly floating in the air wanton he spreads his fragrant hair like ganymede or nereus fair and vainful it would be possible no doubt to produce verses better adapted to recommend the measure than these stanzas which are however the best that can be quoted from francis it might be possible too to suggest some improvement in the structure of the fourth line but however managed the stanza would i think be open to two serious objections the difficulty of finding three suitable rhymes for each stanza and the difficulty of disposing of the fourth line which if made to rhyme with the fourth line of the next stanza produces an awkwardness in the case of those odes which consist of an odd number of stanzas a large proportion of the whole amount if left unrhymed creates an obviously disagreeable effect we come then to the other alternative the stanza with alternate rhymes here the question is about the fourth line which may either consist of six syllables like coleridge's fragment o oh, leave the lily on its stem or of four as in pope's youthful ode on solitude these types being further varied by the addition of an extra syllable to form a double rhyme of these four syllable type seems to me the one to be preferred as giving the effect of the adonic better than if it had been two syllables longer the double rhyme has i think an advantage over the single were it not for its greater difficulty 
much as english lyric poetry owes to double rhymes a regular supply of them is not easy to procure some of them are apt to be cumbrous such as words in Asian, others such as the participle ing dying flying and etc spoil the language of poetry leading to the employment of participles where participles are not wanted and of verbal substantives that exist nowhere else my first intention was to adopt the double rhyme in this measure and i accordingly executed three odes on that plan book one odes twenty two thirty eight book two ode sixteen afterwards i abandoned it and contented myself with the single rhyme on the whole i certainly think this measure answers sufficiently well to the latin sapphic but i have felt its brevity painfully in almost every ode that i have attempted being constantly obliged to omit some part of the latin which i would gladly have preserved the great number of monosyllables in english is of course a reason for acquiescing in lines shorter than the corresponding lines in latin but even in english polysyllables are often necessary and still oftener desirable on grounds of harmony and an allowance of twenty-eight syllables for english for thirty-eight of latin is after all rather short for the place of the alcaic there are various candidates mr tennyson has recently invented a measure which if not intended to reproduce the alcaic was doubtless suggested by it that which appears in his poem of the daisy and in a slightly different form in the lines to mr maurice the two last lines of the latter form of the stanza are indeed evidently copied from the alcaic with a simple omission of the last syllable of the last line of the original still as a whole i doubt whether this form would be as suitable at least for a dignified ode as the other where the initial iambic in the last line substituted for a trochic makes the movement different i was deterred however from attempting either partly by a doubt whether either had been sufficiently naturalized in english to be safely practiced by an unskillful hand partly by the obvious difficulty of having to provide three rhymes per stanza against which the occurrence of one line in each without a rhyme at all was but a poor set off a second metre which occurred to me is that of andrew marvell's horatian ode a variety of which is found twice in mr kebble's christian year here two lines of eight syllables are followed by two of six the difference between the types being that in marvell's ode the rhymes are successive in mr kebble's alternate the external correspondence between this and the alcaic is considerable but the brevity of the english measure struck me at once as a fatal obstacle and i did not try to encounter it a third possibility is the stanza of in memoriam which has been adopted by the clever author of poems and translations by c s c in his version of justum et tenacim i think it very probable that this will be found eventually to be the best representation of the alcaic in english especially as it appears to afford facilities for that linking of stanza to stanza which one who wishes to adhere closely to the logical and rhythmical structure of the latin soon learns to desire but i have not adopted it and i believe there is good reason for not doing so with all its advantages it has the patent disadvantage of having been brought into notice by a poet who is influencing the present generation as only a great living poet can a great writer now an inferior writer hereafter may be able to handle it with some degree of independence but the majority of those who use it at present are sure in adopting mr tennyson's metre to adopt his manner it is no reproach to c s c that his ode reminds us of mr tennyson it is a praise to him that the recollection is a pleasant one but mr tennyson's manner is not the manner of horace and it is the manner of a contemporary the expression a most powerful and beautiful expression of influences to which a translator of an ancient classic feels himself to be too much subjected already what is wanted is a metre which shall have other associations than those of the nineteenth century which shall be the growth of various periods of english poetry and so be independent of any such a metre is that which i have been led to choose the eight syllable iambic with alternate rhymes it is one of the commonest meters in the language and for that reason it is adapted to more than one class of subjects to the gay as well as to the grave but i am mistaken if it is not peculiarly suited to express that concentrated grandeur that majestic combination of high eloquence with high poetry which make the early alcaic odes of horace's third book what they are to us the main difficulty is in accommodating its structure to that of the latin of varying the pauses and of linking stanza to stanza 
it is a difficulty before which i have felt myself almost powerless and i have in consequence been driven to the natural expedient of weakness compromise sometimes evading it sometimes coping with it unsuccessfully in other respects i may be allowed to say that i have found the meter pleasanter to handle than any of the others that i have attempted except perhaps that of the dream of fair women the proportion of syllables in each stanza of english to each stanza of latin is not much greater than in the case of the sapphic thirty-two against forty-one yet except in a few passages chiefly those containing proper names i have had no disagreeable sense of confinement i believe the reason of this to be that the latin alcaic generally contains fewer words in proportion than the latin sapphic the former being favorable to long words the latter to short ones as may be seen by contrasting such lines as dissentientis conditionibus with such as dona presentis rape letus hore ac this no doubt shows that there is an inconvenience in applying the same english iambic measure to two meters which differ so greatly in their practical result but so far as i can see at present the evil appears to be one of those which it is wiser to submit to than to attempt to cure the problem of finding english representatives for the other horatian meters if a more difficult is a less important one the most pressing case is that of the meter known as the second esculpiad the sic te diva potens cipri with this i fear i shall be thought to have dealt rather capriciously having rendered it by four different measures three of them however varieties of the same general type it so happens that the first ode which i translated was the celebrated amoebian poem the dialogue between horace and lydia i had had at that time not the most distant notion of translating the whole of the odes or even any considerable number of them so that in choosing a meter i thought simply of the requirements of the ode in question not of those of the rest of its class indeed i may say that it was the thought of the meter which led me to try if i could translate the ode having accomplished my attempt i turned to another ode of the same class the scarcely less celebrated quium tu mel pomene for this i took a different meter which happens to be identical with that of a solitary ode in the second book non iber ne ke areum being guided still by my feeling about the individual ode, not by any more general considerations. I did not attempt a third until I had proceeded sufficiently far in my undertakings to see that I should probably continue to the end. Then I had to consider the question of a uniform meter to answer to the Latin. Both of those which I had already tried were rendered impracticable by a double rhyme, which, however manageable in one or two odes, is unmanageable, as I have before intimated, in the case of a large number the former of the two measures divested of the double rhyme would i think lose most of its attractiveness the latter suffers much less from the privation the latter accordingly i chose the trochaic character of the first line seems to me to give it an advantage over any metre composed of pure iambics if it were only that it discriminates it from those alternate ten syllable and eight syllable iambics into which it would be natural to render many of the epodes at the same time it did not appear worth while to rewrite the two odes already translated merely for the sake of uniformity as the principle of correspondence to the latin the alternation of the longer and shorter lines is really the same in all three cases nay so tentative has been my treatment of the whole matter that i have even translated one ode the third of book one into successive rather than into alternate rhymes so that, that readers may judge of the comparative effect of the two varieties after this confession of irregularity i need scarcely mention that on coming to the ode which had suggested the meter in its unmutilated state i translated it into the mutilated form not caring either to encounter the inconvenience of the double rhymes or to make confusion worse confounded by giving it what it has in the latin a separate form of its own the remaining meters may be dismissed in a very few words as a general rule i have avoided couplets of any sort and chosen some kind of a stanza as a german critic has pointed out all the odes of horace with one doubtful exception may be reduced to quatrains and though this peculiarity does not so far as we can see affect the character of any of the horatian meters except of course those that are written in stanzas or influence the structure of the latin it must be considered as a happy circumstance for those who wish to render horace into english 
in respect of restraint indeed the english couplet may sometimes be less inconvenient than the quatrain as it is on the whole easier to run couplet into couplet than to run quatrain into quatrain but the couplet seems hardly suitable for an english lyrical poem of any length the very notion of lyrical poetry apparently involving a complexity which can only be represented by rhymes recurring at intervals in the case of one of the three poems written by horace in the measure called the greater esculpiad tu ne quoserius i have adopted the couplet in another nulam vare the quatrain the determining reason in the two cases being the length of the two odes the former of which consists but of eight lines the latter of sixteen the meter which i selected for each is the thirteen syllable trochic of locksley hall and it is curious to observe the different effect of the meter according as it is written in two lines or in four in the locksley hall couplet its movement is undoubtedly trochaic but when it is expanded into a quatrain as in mrs browning's poem of lady geraldine's courtship the movement changes and instead of a more or less equal stress on the alternate syllables the full ictus is only felt in one syllable out of every four in ancient metrical language the meter becomes ionic a minore this very ionic a minore is itself i need not say the meter of a single ode in the third book the miserarum est and I have devised a stanza for it, taking much more pains with the apportionment of the ictus than in the case of the trochic quatrain, which is better able to modulate itself. I have also ventured to invent a meter for that technically known as the fourth archilochian, the solvitur acris haims, by combining the fourteen-syllable with the ten-syllable iambic in an alternately rhyming stanza. Footnote i may be permitted to mention that lord derby in a volume of translations printed privately before the appearance of this work has employed the same measure in rendering the same ode the only difference being that his rhymes are not alternate but successive and footnote the first archilochian de Ferge nives i have represented by a combination of the ten syllable with the four syllable iambic for the so-called greater sapphic the lydia die per omnes I have made another iambic combination, the six syllable with the fourteen syllable arranged as a couplet. The choriambic, I thought, might be exchanged for a heroic stanza, in which the first line should rhyme with the fourth, the second with the third, and a kind of in memoriam elongated. Lastly, I have chosen the heroic quatrain proper, the meter of Gray's elegy, for the two odes in the first book written in what is called metrum alcmanium, laudabunt ali, and te meris et terre rather from a vague notion of the dignity of the measure than from any distinct sense of special appropriateness from this enumeration which i fear has been somewhat tedious it will be seen that i have been guided throughout not by any systematic principles but by a multitude of minor considerations some operating more strongly in one case and some in another i trust however that in all this diversity i shall be found to have kept in view the object on which i have been insisting a metrical correspondence with the original even where i have been most inconsistent i have still adhered to the rule of comprising the english within the same number of lines as the latin i believe tills to be almost essential to the preservation of the character of the horatian lyric which always retains a certain severity and never loses itself in modern exuberance and though i am well aware that the result in my case has frequently perhaps generally been a most unhoratian stiffness i am convinced from my own experience that a really accomplished artist would find the task of composing under these conditions far more hopeful than he had previously imagined it to be yet it is a restraint to which scarcely any of the previous translators of the odes have been willing to submit perhaps professor newman is the only one who has carried it through the whole of the four books most of my predecessors have ignored it altogether it is this which in my judgment is the chief drawback to the success of the most distinguished of them mr theodore martin he has brought to his work a grace and delicacy of expression and a happy flow of musical verse which are beyond my praise and which render many of his odes most pleasing to read as poems i wish he had combined with these qualities that terseness and condensation which reminds us that a roman even when writing songs of love and wine was a roman still some may consider it extraordinary that in discussing the different ways of representing horatian meters i have said nothing of transplanting those meters themselves into english 
I think, however, that an apology for my silence may be found in the present state of the controversy about the English hexameter. Whatever may be the ultimate fate of that struggling alien, and I confess myself to be one of those who doubt whether he can ever be naturalized, most judges will, I believe, agree that for the present, at any rate, his case is sufficient to occupy the literary tribunals, and that to raise any discussion on the rights of others of his class would be premature. Practice, after all, is more powerful in such matters than theory, and hardly at any time in the three hundred years during which we have had a formed literature has the introduction of classical lyric measures into English been a practical question. Stanahurst has had many successors in the hexameter. Probably he has not had more than one or two in the Asclepiad. The sapphic indeed has been tried repeatedly, but it is an exception which is no exception. The meter thus intruded into our language, not being really the Latin sapphic, but a meter of a different kind, found on a mistake in the manner of reading the Latin, into which Englishmen naturally fall, and in which, for convenience sake, they as naturally persist. The late Mr. Clough, whose efforts in literature were essentially tentative, in form as well as in spirit, and whose loss for that very reason is perhaps of more serious import to English poetry than if, with equal genius, he had possessed a more conservative habit of mind, once attempted reproductions of nearly all the different varieties of Horatian meters. They may be found in a paper which he contributed to the fourth volume of the Classical Museum and a perusal of them will, I think, be likely to convince the reader that the task is one in which even great rhythmical power and mastery of language would be far from certain of succeeding. Even the alcaic fragment which he has inserted in his Amours de Voyage, eager for battle here, stood Vulcan here matronal Juno, and with the bow to his shoulder faithful, he who with pure dew laveth of Castile, his flowing locks, who holdeth of Lycia, the oak forest, and the wood that bore him, Delos and Patara's own Apollo. Admirably finished as it is, and highly pleasing as a fragment, scarcely persuades us that twenty stanzas of the same workmanship would be read with adequate pleasure, still less that the same satisfaction would be felt through six and thirty odes. After all, however, a sober critic will be disposed rather to pass judgment on the past than to predict the future, knowing as he must how easily the solvitur ambulando of an artist like Mr. Tennyson may disturb a whole chain of ingenious reasoning on the possibilities of things. The question of the language into which Horace should be translated is not less important than that of the meter, but it involves far less discussion of points of detail, and may, in fact, be very soon dismissed. I believe that the chief danger which a translator has to avoid is that of subjection to the influences of his own period. Whether or no Mr. Merivale is right in supposing that an analogy exists between the literature of the present day and that of post-Augustan Rome, it will not, I think, be disputed that between our period and the Augustan period the resemblances are very few, perhaps not more than must necessarily exist between two periods of high cultivation. It is the fashion to say that the characteristics of the literature of the last century was shallow clearness, the expression of obvious thoughts and obvious, though highly finished language. It is the fashion to retort upon our own generation that its tendency is to overthinking and overexpression, a constant search for thoughts which shall not be obvious and words which shall be above the level of received conventionality. Accepting these as descriptions, however imperfect, of two different types of literature, we can have no doubt to which division to refer the literary remains of Augustan Rome. The Odes of Horace, in particular, will, I think, strike a reader who comes back to them after reading other books, as distinguished by a simplicity, monotony, and almost poverty of sentiment, and as depending for the charm of their external form not so much on novel and ingenious images as on musical words aptly chosen and aptly combined. We are always hearing of wine jars and Thracian convivialities, of parsley wreaths and Syrian nard. The graver topics, which it is the poet's wisdom to forget, are constantly typified by the terrors of quivered meads and painted galonians. There is the perpetual antithesis between youth and age. There is the ever reoccurring image of green and withered trees, and it is only the attractiveness of the Latin, half real, half perhaps arising from association and the romance of a language not one's own that makes us feel this lyrical commonplace more supportable than commonplace is usually found to be. It is this, indeed, which constitutes the grand difficulty of the translator, who may well despair when he undertakes to reproduce beauties depending on expression by a process in which expression is sure to be sacrificed. 
but it would, I think, be a mistake to attempt to get rid of this monotony by calling in the aid of that variety of images and forms of language which modern poetry presents. Here, as in the case of meters, it seems to me that to exceed the bounds of what may be called classical parsimony would be to abandon the one chance, faint as it may be, of producing on the reader's mind something like the impression produced by Horace. I do not say that I have always been as abstinent as I think a translator ought to be. Here, as in all manners connected with this most difficult work, weakness may claim a license of which strength would disdain to avail itself. I only say that I have not surrendered myself to the temptation habitually and without a struggle. As a general rule, while not unfrequently compelled to vary the precise image Horace has chosen, I have substituted one which he has used elsewhere. Where he has talked of triumphs, meaning no more than victories, I have talked of bays. Where he gives the picture of the luxuriant harvests of Sardinia, I have spoken of the wheat on the threshing floors. On the whole I have tried, so far as my powers would allow me, to give my translation something of the color of our eighteenth-century poetry, believing the poetry of that time to be the nearest analogue of the poetry of Augustus's court that England has produced, and feeling quite sure that a writer will bear traces enough of the language and manner of his own time to redeem him from the charge of having forgotten what is, after all, his native tongue. As one instance out of many, I may mention the use of compound epithets as a temptation to which the translator of Horace is sure to be exposed, and which, in my judgment, he ought in general to resist. Their power of condensation naturally recommends them to a writer who has to deal with inconvenient clauses, threatening to swallow up the greater part of a line. But there is no doubt that in the Augustan poets, as compared with the poets of the Republic, they are chiefly conspicuous for their absence, and it is equally certain, I think, that a translator of an Augustan poet ought not to suffer them to be a prominent feature of his style. I have perhaps indulged in them too often myself to note them as a defect in others, but it seems to me that they contribute, along with the Tennysonian meter, to diminish the pleasure with which we read such a version as that of which I have already spoken by C.S.C. of Justum et Tenesum. I may add, too, that I have occasionally allowed the desire of brevity to lead me into an omission of the definite article, which, though perhaps in keeping with the style of Milton, is certainly out of keeping with that of the eighteenth century. It is one of a translator's many refuges, and has been conceded so long that it can hardly be denied him with justice, however it may remind the reader of a bald verbal rendering. A very few words will serve to conclude this somewhat protracted preface. I have not sought to interpret Horace with the minute accuracy which I should think necessary in writing a commentary, and in general I have been satisfied to consult two of the latest editions, those by Orelli and Ritter. In a few instances I have preferred the views of the latter, but his edition will not supersede that of the former, whose commentary is one of the most judicious ever produced, within a moderate compass, upon a classical author. In the few notes which I have added at the end of this volume, I have noticed chiefly the instances in which I have differed from him, in favor either of Ritter's interpretation or of some view of my own. At the same time, it must be said that my translation is not to be understood as always indicating the interpretation I prefer. Sometimes, where the general effect of two views of the construction of a passage has been the same, I have followed that which I believed to be less correct for reasons of convenience. I have, of course, held myself free to deviate in a thousand instances from the exact form of the Latin sentence, and it did not seem reasonable to debar myself from a mode of expression which appeared generally consistent with the original, because it happened to be verbally consistent with a mistaken view of the Latin words. To take an example mentioned in my notes, it may be better in Book 3, Ode 3, Line 25, to make adultere the genitive case after hospes than the dative after splendet. But for practical purposes, the two come to the same thing, both being included in the full development of the thought, and a translation which represents either is substantially a true translation. I have omitted four odes altogether, one in each book, some stanzas of a fifth, and in some other instances I have been studiously paraphrastic. Nor have I thought it worth while to extend my translation from the odes to the epodes. The epodes were the production of Horace's youth, and probably would not have been much cared for by posterity if they had constituted his only title to fame. A few of them are beautiful, but some are revolting, and the rest, as pictures of a roving and sensual passion, remind us of the least attractive portion of the odes. 
In the case of a writer like Horace, it is not easy to draw an exact line, but, though in the odes our admiration of much that is graceful and tender and even true may balance our moral repugnance to many parts of the poet's philosophy of life, it does not seem equally desirable to dwell minutely on a class of compositions where the beauties are fewer and the deformities more numerous and more undisguised. I should add that any coincidences that may be noticed between my version and those of my predecessors are, for the most part, merely coincidences. In some cases I may have knowingly borrowed a rhyme, but only where the rhyme was too common to have created a right of property. Preface to Second Edition I am very sensible of the favor which has carried this translation from a first edition into a second. The interval between the two has been too short to admit of my altering my judgment in any large number of instances, but I have been glad to employ the present opportunity in amending, as I hope, an occasional word or expression, and, in one or two cases, recasting a stanza. The notices which my book has received and the opinions communicated by the kindness of friends have been gratifying to me, both in themselves and as showing the interest which is being felt in the subject of Horatian translation. It is not surprising that there should be considerable differences of opinion about the manner in which Horace is to be rendered, and also about the meter appropriate to particular odes, but I need not say that it is through such discussion that questions like these advance toward settlement. It would indeed be a satisfaction to me to think that the question of translating Horace had been brought a step nearer to its solution by the experiment which I again venture to submit to the public. Preface to the Third Edition the changes which I have made in this impression of my translation are somewhat more numerous than those which I was able to introduce into the last, as might be expected from the longer interval between the times of publication, but the work may still be spoken of as substantially unaltered. End of the Preface Book One, Ode One Mycenas Adivus by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Jim McDougall. Mycenas Adivus. Mycenas, born of monarch ancestors, the shield at once and glory of my life. There are who joy them in the Olympic strife, and love the dust they gather in the course. The goal by hot wheels shunned the famous prize, exalt them to the gods that rule mankind. This joys, if rabbles fickle as the wind, through triple grade of honors bid him rise, that, if his granary has stored away of Libya's thousand floors the yield entire, the man who digs his field as did his sire, with honest pride, no Atlas may sway, by proffered wealth to tempt mere tow and seas the timorous captain of a Cyprian bark, the wind that makes Icarian billows dark. The merchant fears and hugs the rural ease of his own village home, but soon, ashamed of penury, he refits his battered craft. There is, who thinks no scorn of massic draft, who robs the daylight of an hour unblamed, now stretched beneath the arbut on the sword. Now by some gentle river's sacred spring, some love the camp, the clarion's joyous ring, and battle by the mother's soul abhorred. See, patient waiting in the clear, keen air, the hunter, thoughtless of his delicate bride, whether the trusty hounds a stag have eyed, or the fierce Marsian boar has burst the snare. To me the artist's mead, the ivy wreath, is very heaven, me the sweet cool of woods, where satyrs frolic with the nymphs, secludes from rabble rout so but euterpe's breath fail not the flute nor polyhymnia fly averse from stringing new the lesbian lyre o oh, write my name among that minstrel choir and my proud head shall strike upon the sky end of poem this recording is in the public domain Book number one, ode number two, Iam Satis Terrace, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Jim McDougall. Iam Satis Terrace. Enough of snow and hail at last, 
the sire has sent in vengeance down his bolts at his own temple cast appalled the town appalled the lands lest pyrrha's time return with all its monstrous sights when proteus led his flocks to climb the flattened heights when fish were in the elm tops caught where once the stock dove wont to bide and does were floating all distraught adown the tide old tiber hurled in tumult back from mingling with the etruscan main has threatened numa's court with rack and vesta's fane roused by his elia's plaintive woes he vows revenge for guiltless blood and spite of jove his banks o'erflows uxorious flood yes fame shall tell of civic steel that better persian lives had spilt to youths whose minished numbers feel their parents guilt what god shall rome invoke to stay her fall can suppliance overbear the ear of vesta turned away from chant and prayer who comes commissioned to atone for crime like ours at length appear a cloud round thy bright shoulders thrown apollo seer or venus laughter loving dame round whom gay loves and pleasures fly or thou if slighted sons may claim a parent's eye o weary with thy lawn lawn game who lovest fierce shouts and helmets bright and moorish warriors glance of flame or ere he smite or maya's son if now a while in youthful guise we see thee here caesar's avenger such the style thou deignest to bear late be thy journey home and lawn thy sojourn with rome's family nor let thy wrath at our great ron lend wings to fly here take our homage chief and sire here wreathe with bay thy conquering brow and bid the prancing meaty retire our caesar thou end of poem this recording is in the public domain Book One, Ode Three, Sic Te Diva, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Sic Te Diva. Thus may Cyprus' heavenly queen, thus Helen's brethren, stars of brightest sheen, guide thee. May the sire of wind each truant gale, save only Zephyr, bind so do thou fair ship that owest virgil thy precious freight to attic coast safe restore thy lone and whole and save from death the partner of my soul oak and brass of triple fold and compass sure that heart which first made bold to the raging sea to trust a fragile bark nor feared the afric gust with its northern mates at strife nor hyatt's frown nor south wind fury rife mightiest power that hadrian knows will see the waves to madden or compose what had death in store to all those eyes that huge sea beasts unmelting saw saw the swelling of the surge and high ceronian cliffs the seamen scourge heaven's high providence in vain has severed countries with the estranging main if our vessels nevertheless with reckless plunge that sacred bar transgress daring all their goal to win men tread forbidden ground and rush on sin daring all prometheus played his wily game and fire to men conveyed soon as fire was stolen away pale fever's stranger host and wan decay swept over earth's polluted face and slow fate quickened death's once halting pace daedalus the void air tried on wings to humankind by heaven denied Acheron's bar gave way with ease before the arm of laboring Hercules. Naught is there for man too high. Our impious folly even would climb the sky, braves the dweller on the steep, nor lets the bolts of heavenly vengeance sleep. Note to Book One, Ode Three. The Estranging Main. The unplumbed, salt, estranging sea. Matthew Arnold line thirty two and slow fate quickened death's once halting pace the commentators seem generally to connect necessitas with leti i have preferred to separate them necessitas occurs elsewhere in horace book one o thirty five verse seventeen 
Book 3, Ode 1, verse 14. O 24, verse 6. As an independent personage, nearly synonymous with fate, and I do not see why she should not be represented as accelerating the approach of death. End of note. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book 1, Ode 4. Solvitur Acris Hiems by Horace. Translated by John Conington. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Solvitur Acris Hiems. The touch of Zephyr and of spring has loosened winter's thrall. The well dried keels are wheeled again to sea. The ploughman cares not for his fire, nor cattle for their stall, and frost no more is whitening all the lee. Now Caesarea leads the dance, the bright moon overhead, the graces and the nymphs together knit, with rhythmic feet the meadow beat, while Vulcan, fiery red, heats the Cyclopean forge in Etna's pit. Tis now the time to wreathe the brow with branch of myrtle green, or flowers just opening to the vernal breeze. Now Faunus claims his sacrifice among the shady treen, lambkin or kidling, whichsoever he please. Pale death, impartial, walks his round. He knocks at cottage gate and palace portal. Cestius, child of bliss, how should a mortal's hopes be long when short his being's date? Lo here, the fabulous ghost, the dark abyss, the void of the Plutonian hall, where soon as ever you go. No more for you shall leap the auspicious die to seat you on the throne of wine. No more your breast shall glow for Lysidas, the star of every eye. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book 1, Ode 5, Quis Multa Gracilis, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Quis Multa Gracilis, what slender youth, besprinkled with perfume, courts you on roses in some grotto's shade? Fair Pyrrha, say, for whom your yellow hair you braid, so trim, so simple? Ah, how oft shall he lament that faith can fail? That gods can change, viewing the rough black sea with eyes to tempest strange, who now is basking in your golden smile and dreams of you still fancy free, still kind, poor fool, nor knows the guile of the deceitful wind. Woe to the eyes you dazzle without cloud untried, for me they show in yonder fain my dripping garments, vowed to him who curbs the main. Note to Book One, Ode Five. I have ventured to model my version of this ode to some extent on Milton's The High Water Mark, as it has been termed, which Horatian translation has attained. I have not, however, sought to imitate his language, feeling that the attempt would be presumptuous in itself and likely to create a sense of incongruity with the style of the other odes. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book One, Ode Six, Scriberis Vario, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Scriberis Vario, not I, but Varius, he of Homer's brood, a tuneful swan, shall bear you on his wing. Your tale of trophies, won by field or flood, mighty alike to sing. Not mine such themes, Agrippa. No nor mine to chant the wrath that filled Pelides' breast, nor dark Ulysses' wanderings over the brine, nor Pelops' house unblessed. Vast were the task, I feeble. Inborn shame, and she who makes the peaceful liar submit, forbid me to impair great Caesar's fame, and yours by my weak wit. But who may fitly sing of Mars arrayed in adamant mail, or Marian, black with dust of Troy, or tidier's son by Pallas' aid, strong against gods to thrust. Feasts are my theme, my warriors maidens fair, who with paired nails encounter youth in fight. Be fancy free or caught in Cupid's snare, her temper still is light. Note to Book One, Ode Six 
who with pared nails encounter youths in fight. I like Ritter's interpretation of Sectis, cut sharp, better than the common one, which supposes the pairing of the nails to denote that the attack is not really formidable. Sectis will then be virtually equivalent to Bentley's Strictis. Perhaps my translation is not explicit enough. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book One, Ode Seven. Laudabunt a lie, by Horace, translated by John Cunnington, read for LibriVox.org by C. J. Bars. Let others Rhodes or Mytilene sing, or Phesus or Corinth set between, two seas or Thebes or Delphi for its king each famous for Thessalian temp green. There are who make chaste, palace, virgin tower, the daily burden of unending song. And search for wreaths, the olive's rifled bower. The praise of Juno sounds from many a tongue, telling of Argos steeds, Mycenae's gold. For me stern Sparta forges no such spell. No, nor Larissa's plain of richest mould, As bright Albunia echoing from her cell. O headlong Anio, O Tiburnane groves, And orchards saturate with shifting streams, Look how the clear, fresh south from heaven removes, The tempest, nor with rain, perpetual teems, you too be wise, my Plancus, life's worst cloud will melt in air by mellow wine allayed. Dwell you in camps with glittering banners proud, or neath your Tibur's canopy of shade, when Teucer fled before his father's frown. From Salamis they say his temple's deep, he dipped in wine, then wreathed with poplar crown, And bade his comrades lay their grief to sleep. Where fortune bears us, then my sire more kind, There let us go, my own, my gallant crew. Tis Teucer leads, tis Teucer breathes the wind. No more despair, Apollo's word is true. Another Salamis? In kindler air shall yet arise hearts that have borne with me. Worse buffets, drown today in wine your care. Tomorrow we recross the wide, wide sea. Notes And search for wreaths the olive's rifled bower. Undique disreptum I take with Bentley to mean plucked on all hands, i.e. exhausted as a topic of poetical treatment, he well compares Lucretus, Book 1, verse 927, Juvat cu novas de Kerper flores, in signicu me capiti petre inde coronam, und prius noli velerent, Tempora Musse. Tis Teucer leads, tis Teucer breathes the wind. If I have slurred over the Latin, my excuse must be that the precise meaning of the Latin is difficult to catch. Is Teucer called auspex? As taking the auspices like an augur, or as giving the auspices like a god? There are objections to both interpretations. A Roman imperator was not called auspex, though he was attended by an auspex, and was said to have the auspicia. Auspex is frequently used of one who, as we should say, inaugurates an undertaking, but only if he is a god or a deified mortal. Perhaps Horace himself oscillated between the two meanings, his later commentators do not appear to have distinguished them. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Book One, Ode Eight, Lydia Dickperamnus, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Sharon Anthony. Lydia Dickperamnus. Lydia, by all above, why bear so hard on Sybaris, to ruin him with love? What change has made him shun the playing ground, who once so well could bear the dust and sun? Why does he never sit on horseback in his company, nor with uneven bit his Gallic courser tame? Why dreads he yellow Tiber, as to its sully that fair frame? Like poison loads the oil, his arms no longer black and blue with honourable toil. He who erewhile was known for coit or javelin oft and oft beyond the limit thrown, why skulks he, as they say, did Thetis's son before the dawn of Ilion's fatal day, for fear the manly dress should fling him into danger's arms amid the Lycian press? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book One, Ode Nine, Vides ut Alta, by Horace, translated by John Cunnington, read for LibriVox.org, by C. J. Bars. See how it stands, one pile of snow, surate, neath the pressure yield, its groaning woods, the torrents flow. With clear sharp ice is all congealed. Heap high the logs and melt the cold. Good Thaliart, draw the wine we ask. That mellower vintage, four year old, from our cellared Sabine cask, the future trust with Jove, when he has stilled the warring tempest roar on the vexed deep the cypress tree and aged ash are rocked no more oh ask not what the morn will bring but count as gain each day that chance may give you sport in life's young spring nor scorn sweet love nor merry dance while years are green while sullen eld is distant now the walk the game, the whispered talk at sunset held, each in its hour prefer their claim, sweet to the laugh whose feigned alarm the hiding place of beauty tells, the token ravished from the arm, or finger that but ill rebels. Notes, since this ode was printed off, I find that my last stanza bears a suspicious likeness to the version by C. S. C. I cannot say whether it is a case of mere coincidence or an unconscious recollection. It certainly is not one of deliberate appropriation. I have only had the opportunity of seeing this book at distant intervals, and now, on finally comparing his translations with my own, I find that while there are a few resemblances, there are several marked instances of dissimilarity, where though we have adopted the same meter, we do not approach each other in the least. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book 1, Ode 10 Mercuri Facunde, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org, by Peter Tucker. Grandson of Atlas, wise of tongue, O Mercury, whose wit could tame man's savage youth by power of song and plastic game. Thee sing I, herald of the sky, who gavest the lyre its music sweet, hiding whate'er might please thine eye in frolic cheat. See, threatening thee, poor guileless child, Apollo claims in angry tone his cattle. All at once he smiled, his quiver gone. Strong in thy guidance, Hector's sire escaped the Atridae, passed between Thessalian tents and warders' fire, 
of all unseen thou layest unspotted souls to rest thy golden rod pale spectres know blessed power by all thy brethren blessed above below end of poem this recording is in the public domain book one ode eleven tu ne quaesieris by horace translated by john connington read for LibriVox.org by peter tucker ask not tis forbidden knowledge what our destined term of years mine and yours nor scan the tables of your babylonish seers better far to bear the future my leoconoi like the past whether jove has many winters yet to give or this our last this that makes the tyrrhene billows spend their strength against the shore strain your wine and prove your wisdom life is short should hope be more in the moment of our talking envious time has ebbed away seize the present trust to-morrow e'en as little as you may end of poem this recording is in the public domain Book One, Ode Twelve, Quem Virum Aut Heroa, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tucker. What man, what hero, Cleo sweet, on harp or flute wilt thou proclaim? What god shall Echo's voice repeat in mocking game, to Helicon's sequestered shade, or Pindus, or on Hemus chill? where once the hurrying woods obeyed the minstrel's will who by his mother's gift of song held the fleet stream the rapid breeze and led with blandishment along the listening trees whom praise we first the sire on high who gods and men unerring guides who rules the sea the earth the sky their times and tides no mightier birth may he beget no like no second has he known yet nearest to her sires is set minerva's throne nor yet shall bacchus pass unsaid bold warrior nor the virgin foe of savage beasts nor phoebus dread with deadly bow alcides too shall be my theme and leaders twins for horses be he famed for boxing soon as gleam their stars at sea the lashed spray trickles from the steep the wind sinks down the storm cloud flies the threatening billow on the deep obedient lies shall now quirinus take his turn or quiet numa or the state proud tarquin held or cato stern by death made great i regulus and the scaurian name and paulus who at cannae gave his glorious soul fair record claim for all were brave thee furius and fabricius thee rough curius too with untrimmed beard your sires transmitted poverty to conquest reared marcellus's fame its upgrowth hid springs like a tree great julius's light shines like the radiant moon amid the lamps of night dread sire and guardian of man's race to thee o jove the fates assign our caesar's charge his power and place be next to thine whether the parthian threatening rome his eagles scatter to the wind or follow to their eastern home cathay and ind thy second let him rule below thy car shall shake the realms above thy vengeful bolts shall overthrow each guilty grove end of poem this recording is in the public domain book one ode thirteen cum tu lydia by horace translated by john connington Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tucker. Telephus, you praise him still, his waxen arms, his rosy tinted neck. Ah, and all the while I thrill with jealous pangs I cannot, cannot check. See, my colour comes and goes, my poor heart flutters, Lydia, and the dew down my cheek soft stealing shows what lingering torments rack me through and through 
oh tis agony to see those snow-white shoulders scarred in drunken fray or those ruby lips where he has left strange marks that show how rough his play never never look to find a faithful heart in him whose rage can harm sweetest lips which venus kind has tinctured with her quintessential charm happy 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 they whose living love untroubled by all strife binds them till the last sad day nor parts asunder but with parting life end of poem this recording is in the public domain book one ode fourteen o navis referent by horace translated by john connington read for librivox dot org by peter tucker o luckless bark new waves will force you back to sea o haste to make the haven yours e'en now a helpless rack you drift despoiled of oars the afric gale has dealt your mast a wound your sail-yards groan nor can your keel sustain till lashed with cables round a more imperious main your canvas hangs in ribbons rent and torn no gods are left to pray to in fresh need a pine of pontus born of noble forest breed you boast your name and lineage madly blind can painted timbers quell a seaman's fear beware or else the wind makes you its mock and jeer your trouble late made sick this heart of mine and still i love you still am ill at ease oh shun the sea where shine the thick sown cyclades end of poem this recording is in the public domain book one ode fifteen pastor cum traheret by Horace, translated by John Cunnington, read for LibriVox.org by C. J. Bars. When the false swain was hurrying o'er the deep, his Spartan hostess in the Idean bark, old Nerus laid the unwilling winds asleep, that all to fate might hark, speaking through him, home in ill hour you take a prize whom greece shall claim with troops untold leagued by an oath your marriage tie to break and priam's kingdom old alas what deaths you launch on dardan realm what toils are waiting man and horse to tire see pallas trims her aegeus and her helm her chariot and her ire vainly shall you in venus favor strong your tresses comb and for your dames divide on peaceful lyre the several parts of song vainly in chamber hide from spears and nasian arrows barbed with fate and battle's din and ajax in the chase unconquered those adulterous locks though late shall gory dust deface hark tis the death cry of your race look back ulysses comes and pillion nestor gray see salaminian tursor on your track and stenilius in the fray versed or with whip and rein should need require no laggard Mirian too your eyes shall know from far Titus, fiercer than his sire pursues you all aglow him as the stag forgets to graze for fright seeing the wolf at distance in the glade and flies high panting you shall fly despite boasts to your leman maid what though achilles wrathful fleet postpone the day of doom to troy and troy's proud dames her towers shall fall the numbered winters flown wrapped 
and Achaean flames. Notes, and for your dame's divide, on peaceful lyre the several parts of song. I have taken feminists with divides, but it is quite possible that Aureli may be right in constructing it with grata. The case is really one of those noticed in the preface, where an interpretation which would not commend itself to a commentator may be adopted by a poetical translator simply as a free rendering. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book One, Ode Sixteen, O Matre Pulcra, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Sharon Anthony. O Matre Pulcra, O lovelier than the lovely dame that bore you, sentence as you please those scurril verses, be it flame your vengeance craves or Hadrian sees, not Sibylle nor he that haunts rich Pytho, worse the brain confounds not Bacchus, nor the Corybans clash their loud gongs with fiercer sounds than savage wrath, nor sword nor spear appalls it, no, nor ocean's frown, nor ravening fire, nor Jupiter in hideous ruin crashing down. Prometheus, forced, they say, to add to his prime clay some favourite part from every kind, took lion mad and lodged its gall in man's poor heart. T'was wrath that laid Thiestes low, tis wrath that off destruction calls, on cities, and invites the foe to drive his plough over ruined walls. Then calm your spirit, I can tell how once, when youth in all my veins was glowing, Blind with rage I fell on friend and foe in ribald strains. Come, let me change my sour for sweet, And smile complacent as before. Hear me my palinode repeat, And give me back your heart once more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book One, Ode Seventeen Relics Aminem by Horace Translated by John Conington Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Relics Aminem The pleasures of Lucretilis Tempt Faunus from his Grecian seat He keeps my little goats in bliss Apart from wind and rain and heat In safety, rambling over the sward For arbors and for time they peer The ladies of the unfragrant lord nor vipers green with venom fear, nor savage wolves of Mars own breed. My tinder is, while Ustica's dell is vocal with the sylvan reed, and music thrills the limestone fell. Heaven is my guardian, heaven approves a blameless life by song made sweet. Come hither, and the fields and groves their horn shall empty at your feet. Here, sheltered by a friendly tree, in tay and measures you shall sing. Bright Circe and Penelope, love smitten both by one sharp sting. Here shall you quaff beneath the shade, sweet lesbian draughts that injure none. Nor fear lest Mars the realm invade of Semele's Tyonian son, lest Cyrus on a foe too weak lay the rude hand of wild excess, his passion on your chaplet reek, or spoil your undeserving dress. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book One, Ode Eighteen, Nulum Water, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, February Eleventh, Two K Sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Nulum Water. Waters, are you trees in planting? Put in none before the vine, in the rich domain of Tiber by the walls of Catullus. There's a power above that hampers all that sober brains design, and the troubles man is heir to thus are quelled, and only thus. Who can talk of want or warfare when the wine is in his head, 
not of thee good father bacchus and of venus fair and bright but should any dream of license there's a lesson may be read how twas wine that drove the centaurs with the lapithae to fight and the thracians too may warn us truth and falsehood good and ill how they mix them when the wine god's hand is heavy on them laid never never gracious bacchus may i move thee against thy will or uncover what is hidden in the verdure of thy shade silence thou thy savage symbols and the barasindine horn in their train self-love still follows dully desperately blind and vainglory towering upwards in its empty-headed scorn and the faith that keeps no secrets with a window in its mind end of poem this recording is in the public domain Book One, Ode Nineteen, Mater Saiwa Cupidinum, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayt of February twelfth to K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Mater Saiwa Cupidinum. Cupid's mother, cruel dame, and Simile's Theban boy, and license bold, bid me kindle into flame this heart by waning passion now left cold oh the charms of glycera that hue more dazzling than the parian stone oh that sweet tormenting play that too fair face that blinds when looked upon venus comes in all her might quits cyprus from my heart nor lets me tell of the parthian bold in flight nor scythian hordes nor aught that breaks her spell heap the grassy altar up bring vervain boys and sacred frankincense fill the sacrificial cup a victim's blood will soothe her vehemence end of poem this recording is in the public domain book one ode twenty Wille Potabis by Horace Translated by John Conington Read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton February 15th to K16 Roebuck, South Carolina Wille Potabis Not large my cups, nor rich my cheer This Sabine wine which erst I sealed That day the applauding theatre Your welcome pealed Dear knight, my Cenus, as twere fain that your paternal river's banks and vatican in sportive strain should echo thanks for you calinian grapes are pressed and caicuban these cups of mine falernum's bounty ne'er has blessed nor formian vine end of poem this recording is in the public domain Book One, Ode Twenty One, Dianam Tenere, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Dianam Tenere, of Diane's praises, tender maidens tell, of Cynthus' unshorn god, young striplings sing, and bright Latona, well beloved of heaven's high king, sing her that streams and sylvan foliage loves whatever on algida's chill brow is seen in arimanthian groves dark-leaved or cragus green sing tempe too glad youth in strain as loud and phoebus birthplace and that shoulder fair his golden quiver proud and brother's lyre to bear his arm shall banish hunger plague and war to persia and to britain's coast away from rome and caesar far if you have zeal to pray End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book One, Ode Twenty Two, Integer Vitae, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, 
February 16th to K-16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Integer Vitae No need of Moorish archer's craft to guard the pure and stainless liver. He wants not, Fuscus, poisoned shaft to store his quiver. Whether he traverse Libyan shoals or Caucasus forlorn and horrent, or lands where fair Hydaspes rolls his fabled torrent. A wolf, while roaming trouble free in Sabine wood as fancy led me, unarmed I sang my lalage, beheld and fled me. Dire monster in her broad oak woods, fierce Daunia fosters none such other, nor Juba's land of lion broods the thirsty mother. Place me where on the ice-bound plain no tree is cheered by summer breezes, where Jove descends in sleety rain or sullen freezes. Place me where none can live for heat, neath Phoebus' very chariot plant me. That smile so sweet, that voice so sweet, shall still enchant me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book One, Ode Twenty Three, Vitas Hanulio, by Horace, translated by John Cunnington, read for LibriVox.org by Alexandra Helms. You fly me, Chloe. As o'er trackless hills a young fawn runs her timorous dam to find, Whom empty terror thrills of woods and whispering wind. Whether tis spring's first shiver faintly heard through the light leaves, Or lizards in the brake the wrestling thorns have stirred, Her heart, her knees, they quake. Yet I, who chase you, no grim lion am, no tiger fell to crush you in my gripe. Come, learn to leave your dam for lovers' kisses ripe. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book One, O Twenty Four, Quis Desiderio, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Quis desiderio? Why blush to let our tears unmeasured fall for one so dear? Begin the mournful stave, Malpomene, to whom the sire of all sweet voice with music gave. And sleeps he then the heavy sleep of death, Quintilius? Piety, twin sister dear of justice, naked truth, unsullied faith, when will ye find his peer? By many a good man wept. Quintilius dies. By none than you, my Virgil, truly a wept. Devout in vain you chide the faithless guise, Asking your loan ill-kept. No, though more suasive than the bard of trace, You swept the lyre that trees were fain to hear. Never should the blood revisit his pale face, Whom once with wants severe, Mercury has folded with the sons of night, Untaught to prayer fate's prison to unseal. Ah, heavy grief! But patience makes more light what sorrow may not heal. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book One, O Twenty Six, Musis Amicus, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Sharon Anthony. Musis Amicus. The muses love me, fear and grief, the winds may blow them to the sea. Who quailed before the wintry chief of Scythia's realm is not to me. What cloud o'er Tiridates lowers, I care not, I. O nymph divine of virgin springs, with sunniest flowers, a chaplet for my Lamia twine. Pimply sweet, my praise were vain without thee. String this maiden lyre, attune for him the lesbian strain, O goddess with thy sister choir.
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book One, Ode Number Twenty Seven. Natus in Usum, by Horace, translated by John Cunnington, read for LibriVox.org, by C.J. Bars. What? Fight with cups that should give joy? Tis barbarous. Leave such savage ways to Thracians. Bacchus, shamefaced boy, is blushing at your bloody phrase. The Median saber, lights and wine, was stranger contrast ever seen? Cease, cease this brawling, comrades mine, and still upon your elbows lean. Well, shall I take a topper's part of fierce Falernian? Let our guest, Magella's brother, say what dart. Give the death wound that makes him blessed. He hesitates. No other hire shall tempt my sober brains. Whate'er the goddess tames you, no base fire. She kindles, tis some gentle fair. Allures you still? Come, tell me truth, and trust my honor. That the name, that wild? Charybdis yours? Poor youth! Oh, you deserved a better flame. What wizard, what Thessalian spell, what god can save you, hampered thus, to cope with this chimera fell, would task another Pegasus? Note, our guest, Magilla's brother, there is no warrant in the original for representing this person as a guest of the company, but the ode is equally applicable to a tavern party, where all share alike, and an entertainment where there is distinction between hosts and guests. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book 1. Ode 28. Timaris et Terra by Horace, translated by John Cunnington, read for LibriVox.org by C.J. Bars. The sea, the earth, the innumerable sand, a Cretus thou couldst measure, now alas, a little dust on Matine's shore has spanned. That soaring spirit, vain it was to pass, the gates of heaven, and send thy soul in quest, or air's wide realms, for thou hadst yet to die. I, dead is Pelop's father, heaven's own guest, an old Tithonus, wrapped from earth to sky, and Minos, made the council friend of Jove, and Panthus, sun has yielded up his breath, once more, though down he plucked the shield to prove his prowess under Troy, and bade grim death, or skin and nerves alone exert its power, not he, you grant, in nature meanly read. Yes, all await the inevitable hour, the downward journey all one day must tread. Some bleed, to glut the war god's savage eyes. Fate meets the sailor from the hungry brine. Youth jostles age in funeral obscuies. Each brow in turn is touched by proserpine. Me too, Orion's mate, the southern blast, whelmed in deep death beneath the Illyrian wave. But grudge not, sailor, of driven sand to cast, A handful on my head that owns no grave. So, though the eastern tempests loudly threat, Hesperia's mane, may green Venusia's crown, Be stripped while you lie warm, may blessings yet 
stream from Tarantum's guard, great Neptune down, and gracious Jove into your open lap. What? Shrink you not from crime whose punishment falls on your innocent children? It may hap, imperious fate will make yourself repent. My prayers shall reach the avengers of all wrong. No expiations shall the curse unbind. Great though your haste, I would not task you long. Thrice sprinkle dust, then scud before the wind. Notes. I have translated this ode as it stands, without attempting to decide whether it is a dialogue or monologue. Perhaps the opinion which supports it to be spoken by Horace in his own person as if he had actually perished in the shipwreck alluded to in Book 3, Ode 4, Verse 27. Me non extinct sicula palinurus unda deserves more attention than it has received. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book 1, Ode 29, Ichi Beatis by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Ichi Beatis Your heart on Arab wealth is said, good Ichius. You would try your steel on Saber's kings, unconquered yet, and make the meat your fetters feel. Come, tell me what barbarian fare will serve you now, her bridegroom slain, what page from court with essenced hair will tender you the bowl you'd rein, well skilled to bend the Syrian bow his father carried? Who shall say that rivers may not uphill flow, and Tiber's self return one day, if you would change Panisius' works, that costly purchase, and the clan of Socrates for shields and dirks, whom once we thought a saner man? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 30, Book 1, Ode 30, O Venus, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Patty Marie. O Venus, come, Canadian, Paphian Venus, come, thy well-beloved Cyprus spurn, haste where for thee in Glycera's home sweet odors burn. Bring to thy Cupid, glowing warm, graces and nymphs unzoned and free, and youth that lacking thee lacks charm, and Mercury. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book One, Ode Thirty One, Quid Dedicatum by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Quid Dedicatum What blessing shall the bard entreat, the god he hallows, as he pours the wine cup? Not the mounds of wheat that load Sardinian threshing floors, not Indian gold or ivory, no, nor flocks that over Calabria stray, nor fields that Lyris, still and slow, is eating, unperceived, away. Let those whose fate allows them train Calenum's vine, let trader bold from golden cups rich liquor drain, for wares of Syria bought and sold, heaven's favorite, sooth, for thrice a year, he comes and goes across the brine, undamaged. I in plenty here, on endives, mallows, succory dine. O oh, grant me, Phoebus, calm content, strength unimpaired, a mind entire, old age without dishonor spent, nor unbefriended by the liar. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book One, Ode 32, Poskimor, by Horace, translated by John Connington. 
Read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clay to February 17th, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Poskimur They call. If aught in shady dwell we twain have warbled, To remain long months or years, Now breathe, my shell, a Roman strain, Thou, strung by Lesbos' minstrel hand, The bard who, mid the clash of steel, Or haply mooring to the strand his battered keel, Of Bacchus and the Muses sung, And Cupid, still at Venus' side, and Lycus, beautiful and young, dark-haired, dark-eyed. O sweetest lyre to Phoebus dear, delight of Jove's high festival, blessed balm in trouble, hail and hear whene'er I call. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book One, Ode Thirty Three. Albi Nedoleas by Horace. Translated by John Conington. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Albi Nedoleas. What, Albius, why this passionate despair for cruel Glycera? Why melt your voice in dolorous strains because the perjured fair has made a younger choice? See, narrow browed Lycoris, how she glows for Cyrus. Cyrus turns away his head to follow his frown but sooner gentle rose apulian wolves shall wed than fall away to so mean a conqueror strike so venus wills it neath her brazen yoke she loves to couple forms and minds unlike all for a heartless joke for me sweet love had forged a milder spell but myrtale still kept me her fond slave more stormy she than the tempestuous swell that crests Calabria's wave. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book One, Ode Thirty Four, Parcus Deorum, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, February eighteenth, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Parcus Deorum. My prayers were scant, my offerings few, while witless wisdom fooled my mind. But now I trim my sails anew, and trace the course I left behind. For lo, the sire of heaven on high, by whose fierce bolts the clouds are riven, to-day through an unclouded sky his thundering steeds and car has driven. E'en now dull earth and wandering floods, And Atlas limitary range, And Styx and Tainarus dark abodes Are reeling. He can lowliest change and loftiest, Bring the mighty down and lift the weak, With whirring flight comes fortune, Plucks the monarch's crown, And decks therewith some meaner white. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book One, Ode Thirty Five, O Diva Gratum, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clay to February eighteenth, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. O Diva Gratum. Lady of Antium, grave and stern, O goddess, who canst lift the low to high estate, In sudden turn a triumph to a funeral show, Thee, the poor hind that tills the soil, implores, Their queen they own in thee, Who in Bithynian vessel toil amid the vexed Carpathian sea, Thee, Dacians fierce and Scythian hordes, peoples and towns and rome their head and mothers of barbarian lords and tyrants in their purple dread lest spurned by thee in scorn should fall the state's tall prop lest crowds on fire to arms to arms the loiterers call 
and thrones be tumbled in the mire necessity precedes thee still with hard fierce eyes and heavy tramp her hand the nails and wedges fill the molten lead and stubborn clamp hope precious truth in garb of white attend thee still nor quit thy side when with changed robes thou takest thy flight in anger from the homes of pride then the false herd the faithless fair start backward when the wine runs dry the jocund guests too light to bear an equal yoke asunder fly o shield our caesar as he goes to furthest britain and his band rome's harvest send on eastern foes their fear and on the red sea strand o wounds that scarce have ceased to run o brother's blood o iron time what horror have we left undone has conscience shrunk from aught of crime what shrine has rapine held in awe what altar spared o oh, haste and beat the blunted steel we yet may draw on arab and on massajit end of poem this recording is in the public domain book one ode thirty six et ture et fidibus by horace translated by john conington Read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, February 23rd, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Et ture et fidibus. Bid the lyre and cittern play, and kindle incense, shed the victim's gore. Heaven has watched o'er Numida, and brings him safe from far Hispania's shore. Now returning, he bestows on each dear comrade all the love he can but to lamia most he owes by whose sweet side he grew from boy to man note we in our calendar this festal day with whitest mark from crete let it flow the old wine jar and ply to salian time your restless feet damalis tosses off her wine <laughs> but Basus sure must prove her match to-night give us roses all to twine and to parsley green and lilies deathly white every melting eye will rest on damalis lovely face but none may part damalis from our new-found guest she clings and clings like ivy round his heart end of poem this recording is in the public domain Book One, Ode Thirty Seven, Nunc S. Bibendum by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf. Now drink we deep, now featly tread a measure, now before each shrine with salient feasts the table spread. The time invites us, comrades mine. Twas shame to broach before to-day the Secuban, while Egypt's dame threatened our power in dust to lay and wrap the capital in flame. Girt with her foully masculate throng, by fortune's sweet new wine befooled, in hope's ungoverned weakness strong to hope for all, but soon she cooled to see one ship from burning scape. Great Caesar taught her dizzy brain, made mad by Mariotic grape to feel the sobering truth of pain and gave her chase from italy as after doves fierce falcons speed as hunters neath hemonia's sky chase the tired hare so might he lead the fiend enchained she sought to die more nobly nor with woman's dread quailed at the steel nor timorously in her fleet ships to covert fled amid her ruined halls she stood unblenched and fearless to the end grasped the fell snakes that all her blood might with a cold black venom blend death's purpose flushing in her face nor to our ships the glory gave that she no vulgar dame should grace a triumph crownless and a slave 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book One, Ode Thirty Eight, Persicos Odi, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Persicos Odi. No Persian cumber, boy, for me. I hate your garlands, linden plated. Leave winter's rose where on the tree it hangs belated. Wreathe me plain myrtle. Never think plain myrtle either's wear unfitting. Yours as you wait. Mine as I drink, in vine bower sitting. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Ode One, Mutum ex Metello, by Horace. Translated by John Connington. Read for LibriVox.org by Douglas Thornton. Mutum ex Metello The broils that from Metellus date, The secret springs, the darkened trees, The freaks of fortune, and the great confederate In disastrous leads, and arms with uncleansed slaughter red, A work of danger and distrust you treat, As one on fire should tread, Scarce hid by treacherous ashen crust. Let tragedy's stern muse be mute a while, And when your ordered page has told Rome's tale, That buskin foot again shall mount the attic stage, Polio, the pale defendant's shield, In deep debate the senate's stay, The hero of Dalmatic field by triumph crowned with deathless bay. Even now with trumpet's threatening blare You thrill our ears, the clarion bray, the lightnings of the armor scare the steed and daunt the rider's gaze. Methinks I hear of leaders proud with no uncomely dust disdained, and all the world by conquest bowed, and only Cato's soul unchained. Yes, Juno and the powers on high that left their Afric to its doom have led the victor's progeny as victims to Hergertha's tomb. What field by Latian blood drops fed Proclaims not the unnatural deeds it buries, And the earthquake dread whose distant thunder shook the meads. What gulf, what river has not seen those sights of sorrow? Nay, what sea has dawny and carnage yet left green? What coast from Roman blood is free? But pause, gay muse, nor leave your play another sea and dirge to sing. With me to Venus's power away, and there attune a lighter string. Note to Book Two, Ode One, Line Twenty One. Methinks I hear of leaders proud. Horace supposes himself to hear not the leaders themselves, but Polio's recitation of their exploits. There is nothing weak in this, as Aureli thinks. Horace has not seen Polio's work, but compliments him by saying that he can imagine what its finest passages will be like. Quote, I can fancy how you will glow in your description of the great generals, and of Cato. Quote, Possibly, non indecoro polveri sordidos may refer to the deaths of the republican generals, whom old recollections would lead Horace to admire. We may then compare Ode 7 of this book, verse 11. Confracta virtus seminasis turpe solum tetigerimento, where as will be seen, I agree with Ritter against Aureli in supposing death in battle rather than submission to be meant, though Horace, writing from a somewhat different point of view, has chosen there to speak of the vanquished as dying ingloriously. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Ode Two, Nullis Argento, by Horace, translated by John Cunnington, read for LibriVox.org by Douglas Thornton. The silver salus, 
shows not fair while buried in the greedy mine. You love it not till moderate wear have given it shine. Honor to Proculius, he to brethren played a father's part. Fame shall embalm through years to be that noble heart. Who curbs a greedy soul may boast more power than if his broad-based throne bridged Libya's sea, and either coast were all his own. Indulgence bids the dropsy grow. Who fain would quench the palate's flame must rescue from the watery foe the pal weak frame. Freatus, throned where Cirrus sate, may count for blessed with vulgar herds, but not with virtue. Soon or late from lying words she weans men's lips. For him she keeps the crown, the purple, and the bays, who dares to look on treasured heaps with unblenched gaze. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Ode Three, Equem Memento, by Horace, translated by John Cunnington, read for LibriVox.org by Douglas Thornton. An equal mind, when storms over cloud, maintain, nor neath a brighter sky let pleasure make your heart too proud, O Delius, Delius sure to die. Whether in gloom you spend each year, Or through long holy days at ease in grassy nook Your spirit cheer with old Falernian vintages, Where poplar pale and pine tree high Their hospitable shadows spread entwined, And panting waters try to hurry down their zigzag bed. Bring wine and scents and roses bloom, Too brief, alas, to that sweet place while life and fortune in the loom of the three sisters yield you grace. Soon must you leave the woods you buy, your villa washed by Tiber's flow, leave, and your treasures heaped so high, your reckless air will level low. Whether from Argus's founder born, in wealth you lived beneath the sun, or nursed in beggary and scorn, you fall to death, who pities none. One way I'll travel, the dark urn shakes each man's lot, that soon or late will force him, hopeless of return, on board the exiled ship of fate. Note to Book Two, Ode Three, Line Nine, Where Poplar Pell and Pine Tree High. I have translated according to the common reading, quote, Que pinus et obliquo, quote, without stopping to inquire whether it is sufficiently supported by MSS. Those who with Aureli prefer, quote, quo pinus quid obliquo, quote, may substitute. Know you why pine and poplar high, their hospitable shadows spread entwined? Why panting waters try to hurry down their zigzag bed? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Ode Four, Ne Sit On Kilai, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox by Patty Marie. Ne Sit On Kilai. Why, Xanthius, blush to own you love your slave? Brysus, long ago a captive, could Achilles move with breast of snow? Tecmessa's charms enslaved her lord, stout Ajax, heir of Telamon. Atrides, in his pride, adored the maid he won, when Troy to Thessaly gave way, and Hector's all too quick decease made Pergamus an easier prey to wearied Greece. What if, as Auburn Phyllis mate, you graft yourself on regal stem? Oh, yes, be sure her sires were great. 
she weeps for them. Believe me, from no rascal scum your charmer sprang. So true a flame, such hate of greed, could never come from vulgar dame. With honest fervor I commend those lips, those eyes. You need not fear a rival, hurrying on to end his fortieth year. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Ode Six, Septimi Gades by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Septimi Gades. Septimius, who with me would brave far Gades and Cantabrian land, untamed by home and Moorish wave that whirls the sand, fair Tiber, town of Argive kings. There would I end my days serene, at rest from seas and travellings, and service seen. Should angry fate those wishes foil, then let me seek Galizes, sweet, to skin-clad sheep, and that rich soil, the Spartan seat. Oh, what can match the green recess, whose honey not to Hybla yields, whose olives vie with those that bless Venafrum's fields? Long springs, mild winters glad that spot by Jove's good grace, and Aulon, dear, to fruitful Bacchus envies not Falernian cheer. That spot, those happy heights desire our sojourn. There, when life shall end, your tear shall do my yet warm pyre, your bard and friend. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Ode Seven, O Saipe Mecum, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. O Saipe Mecum, O, oh, oft with me in troublous time involved when Brutus warred in Greece, who gives you back to your own clime and your own gods, a man of peace, Pompey, the earliest friend I knew, with whom I oft cut short the hours with wine, my hair bright bathed in dew of Syrian oils and wreathed with flowers. With you I shared Philippi's route, unseemly parted from my shield, when valor fell and warriors stout were tumbled on the inglorious field. But I was saved by Mercury, wrapped in thick mist yet trembling sore, while you to that tempestuous sea were swept by battle's tide once more. Come, pay to Jove the feast you owe, Lay down those limbs, with warfare spent, beneath my laurel. Nor be slow to drain my cask, for you t'was meant. Lethe's true draught is massic wine. Fill high the goblet, pour out free rich streams of unguent. Who will twine the hasty wreath from myrtle tree or parsley? Whom will Venus seat, chairman of cups? Are beckons sane? Then I'll be sober. Oh, tis sweet to fool when friends come home again. Translator's Note A Man of Peace Quiritem is generally understood of a citizen with rights undiminished. I have interpreted it of a civilian opposed to a soldier, as in the well-known story in Suetonius, Caesar, Chapter 70, where Julius Caesar takes the Tenth Legion at their word and intimates that they are disbanded by the simple substitution of Quirites for Milites in his speech to them. But it may very well include both. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Ode Eight, Ulla Si Juris, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Ulla Si Juris. Had chastisement for perjured truth, Barin, marked you with a curse. Did one wry nail or one black tooth but make you worse? I trust you. But when plighted lies have pledged you deepest, lovelier far you sparkle forth, of all young eyes the ruling star. Disdain to mock your mother's bones, and night still signs, 
and all the sky and gods that on their glorious thrones chill death defy ay venus smiles the pure nymphs smile and cupid tyrant lord of hearts sharpening on bloody stone the while his fiery darts new captives fill the nets you weave new slaves are bred and those before though oft they threaten never leave your godless door the mother dreads you for her son the thrifty sire the new-wed bride lest lured by you her precious one should leave her side end of poem this recording is in the public domain book two ode nine non semper imbres by horace translated by john connington Read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, February 23rd to K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Non Semper Imbres The rain, it rains not every day on the soaked meads. The Caspian main not always feels the unequal sway of storms. Nor on Armenia's plain dear wild goose lies the cold dull snow through all the year nor north winds keen upon garganian oak woods blow and strip the ashes of their green you still with cheerful tones pursue your lost lost mistace hesper sees your passion when he brings the dew and when before the sun he flees yet not for loved antilochus grey nestor wasted all his years in grief nor o'er young troilus his parents and his sister's tears for ever flowed at length have done with these soft sorrows rather tell of caesar's trophies newly won and hoar nephate's icy fell and medus flood mid conquered tribes rolling a less presumptuous tide and scythians taught as rome prescribes henceforth o'er narrower steps to ride end of poem this recording is in the public domain book two ode ten rectius vives by horace translated by john connington Read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clay to February 23rd, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Rectius Vives Licinius, trust a seaman's lore, Steer not too boldly to the deep, Nor, fearing storms, by treacherous shore Too closely creep who makes the golden mean his guide shuns miser's cabin foul and dark shuns gilded roofs where pomp and pride are envy's mark with fiercer blasts the pine's dim height is rocked proud towers with heavier fall crash to the ground and thunders smite the mountains tall in sadness hope in gladness fear against coming change will fortify your breast the storms that jupiter sweeps o'er the sky he chases why should rain to-day bring rain to-morrow python's foe is pleased sometimes his lyre to play nor bends his bow be brave in trouble meet distress with dauntless front but when the gale too prosperous blows be wise no less and shorten sail end of poem this recording is in the public domain book two ode eleven quid bellicosus by horace translated by john connington Read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, February 23rd, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Quid Bellicosus Oh, ask not what those sons of war, Cantabrian, Scythian, each intend, Disjoined from us by Hadria's bar, Nor puzzle, Quintius, how to spend a life so simple. Youth removes, and beauty too 
and hoar decay drives out the wanton tribe of loves and sleep that came or night or day the sweet spring flowers not always keep their bloom nor moonlight shines the same each evening why with thoughts too deep or task a mind of mortal frame why not just thrown at careless ease neath plain or pine our locks of grey perfumed with syrian essences and wreathed with roses while we may lie drinking bacchus puts to shame the cares that waste us where's the slave to quench the fierce falernian's flame with water from the passing wave who'll coax coy lyda from her home go bid her take her ivory lyre the runaway and haste to come her wild hair bound with spartan tire end of poem this recording is in the public domain Book Two, Ode Twelve, Nolis Longa Ferrae, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, February twenty fourth, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Nolis Longa Ferrae. The weary war where fierce Numantia bled, fell Hannibal, the swollen Sicilian main purpled with Punic blood not mine to wed these to the lyre's soft strain nor cruel lapithae nor mad with wine centaurs nor by herculean arm o'ercome the earth-born youth whose terrors dimmed the shine of the resplendent dome of ancient saturn you mycenas best in pictured prose of caesar's warrior feats will tell and captive kings with haughty crest led through the roman streets on me the muse has laid her charge to tell of your licimnia's voice the lustrous hue of her bright eye her heart that beats so well to mutual passion true how naught she does but lends her added grace whether she dance or join in bantering play or with soft arms the maiden choir embrace on great diana's day say would you change for all the wealth possessed by rich achaemenes or phrygia's heir or the full stores of araby the blessed one lock of her dear hair while to your burning lips she bends her neck or with kind cruelty denies the due she means you not to beg for but to take or snatches it from you end of poem this recording is in the public domain book two ode thirteen ile et nefasto by horace translated by john conington Read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, St. Patrick's Day, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Ile et Nefasto Black day he chose for planting thee, accursed he reared thee from the ground, the bane of children yet to be, the scandal of the village round. His father's throat the monster pressed beside, and on his hearthstone spilt, I ween, the blood of midnight guest black caulkian drugs whate'er of guilt is hatched on earth he dealt in all who planted in my rural stead thee fatal wood thee sure to fall upon thy blameless master's head the dangers of the hour no thought we give them punic seaman's fear is all of bosporus nor aught recks he of pitfalls otherwhere the soldier fears the masked retreat of parthia parthia dreads the thrall of rome but death with noiseless feet has stolen and will steal on all how near dark pluto's court i stood and aeacus judicial throne the blessed seclusion of the good and sappho with sweet lyric moan bewailing her ungentle sex 
and thee alcaeus louder far chanting thy tale of woeful wrecks of woeful exile woeful war in sacred awe the silent dead attend on each but when the song of combat tells and tyrants fled keen ears pressed shoulders closer throng what marvel when at those sweet airs the hundred-headed beast spellbound each black ear droops and fury's hairs uncoil their serpents at the sound prometheus too and pelops sire in listening lose the sense of woe orion hearkens to the lyre and lets the lynx and lion go translator's note in sacred awe the silent dead attend on each sacro digna silentio digna eo silentio quod in sacris faciendis observatur ritter end of poem this recording is in the public domain section fifty one book two ode fourteen Ehu Hugakes by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Patty Marie. Ehu Hugakes. Ah, posthumous, they fleet away our years, nor piety one hour can win from wrinkles and decay and death's indomitable power not though three hundred bullocks flame each year to soothe the tearless king who holds huge geryon's triple frame and titius in his watery ring that circling flood which all must stem who eat the fruits that nature yields wearers of the haughtiest diadem or humblest tillers of the fields. In vain we shun war's contact red, or storm-tossed spray of Hadrian main. In vain the season through we dread for our frail lives, Giroco's bane. Cocytus black and stagnant ooze must welcome you, and Danao's seed ill-famed and ancient Sisyphus to never-ending toil decreed. Your land, your house, your lovely bride must lose you. Of your cherished trees, none to its fleeting master's side will cleave but those sad cypresses. Your heir, a larger soul, will drain the hundred padlocked caicuban, and richer spilth the pavement stain than e'er at pontiff supper ran. Note, not though three hundred bullocks flame each year, I have at last followed Ritter in taking Trecanos as loosely put for three hundred sixty-five, a steer for each day of the year. The hyperbole, as he says, would otherwise be too extravagant. And richer spilth the pavement stain. Our vaults have wept with drunken spilth of wine. Shakespeare, Timon of Athens. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Ode Fifteen, Yam Pauka Aratro, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, February twenty-fourth, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Yam Pauka Aratro. Few roots of ground the piles we raise will leave to plow. Ponds wider spread than Lucrian Lake will meet the gaze on every side. The plain, unwed, will top the elm. The violet bed, the myrtle, 
peach delicious sweet on olive grounds their scent will shed where once were fruit trees yielding meat thick bays will screen the midday range of fiercest suns not such the rule of romulus cato sage and all the bearded good old school each roman's wealth was little worth his country's much no colonnade for private pleasance wooed the north with cool prolixity of shade none might the casual sod disdain to roof his home a town alone at public charge a sacred fane were honoured with the pomp of stone End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Ode Sixteen, Otium Divos by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, February twenty-sixth, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Otium Divos. For ease, in wide Aegean caught the sailor prays, When clouds are hiding the moon, Nor shines of starlight aught for seaman's guiding. For ease, the mead with quiver gay, For ease, rude thrace in battle cruel. Can purple buy it, Grosphus? Nay, nor gold nor jewel. No pomp, no lictor clears the way Mid rabble routs of troublous feelings nor quails the cares that sport and play round gilded ceiling. More happy he whose modest board his father's well-worn silver brightens. No fear nor lust for sordid hoard his light sleep frightens. Why bend our bows of little span? Why change our homes for regions under another sun? What exiled man from self can sunder? care climbs the bark and trims the sail cursed fiend nor troops of horse can scaper more swift than stag more swift than gale that drives the vapour blessed in the present look not forth on ills beyond but soothe each bitter with slow calm smile no suns on earth unclouded glitter achilles light was quenched at noon a long decay to thonus minished my hours it may be yet will run when yours are finished for you sicilian heifers low bleat countless flocks for you are neighing proud courses afric purples glow for your arraying with double dyes a small domain the soul that breathed in grecian harping my portion these and high disdain of ribald carping end of poem this recording is in the public domain book two old seventeen curme querellis by horace translated by john connington read for librivox dot org by Lenny. why rend my heart with that sad sigh it cannot please the gods or me that you Messenus, first should die my pillar of prosperity ha huh. should i lose one half my soul untimely can the other stay behind it life that is not whole is that as sweet the self-same day shall crush us twain no idle oath has horace sworn whene'er you go we both will travel travel both the last dark journey down below no not chimera's fiery breath nor gaius could he rise again shall part us justice strong as death so wills it so the fates ordain whether twas libra saw me born or angry scorpio lord malign of nato hour or capricorn the tyrant of the western brine our planets sure with concord strange are blended you by jove's blessed power were snatched from out the baleful range of saturn and the evil hour was stayed when rapturous benches full three times the auspicious thunder pealed 
me the cursed trunk that smote my school had slain but faunus strong to shield the friends of mercury checked the blow in mid descent be sure to pay the victims and the fane you owe your bard a humbler lamb will slay end of poem this recording is in the public domain Book Two, Ode Eighteen, Non Ebur, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, St. Patrick's Day, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Non Ebur. Carven ivory have I none, no golden cornice in my dwelling shines. Pillars choice of Libyan stone upbear no architrave from Attic mines. Twas not mine to enter into Attila's broad realms and unknown air, nor for me fair clients spin Laconian purples for their patrons' wear. Truth is mine, and genius mine. The rich man comes and knocks at my low door. Favored thus I ne'er repine nor weary out indulgent heaven for more in my sabine homestead blest why should i further tax a generous friend suns are hurrying suns a west and new-born moons make speed to meet their end you have hands to square and hew vast marble blocks hard on your day of doom ever building mansions new nor thinking of the mansion of the tomb now you press on oceans bound where waves on baye beat as earth were scant now absorb your neighbor's ground and tear his landmarks up your own to plant hedges set round clients farms your avarice tramples see the outcasts fly wife and husband in their arms their father's gods their squalid family yet no hall that wealth e'er planned waits you more surely than the wider room traced by death's yet greedier hand why strain so far you cannot leap the tomb earth removes the impartial sod alike for beggar and for monarch's child nor the slave of hell's dark god conveyed prometheus back with a bribe beguiled Pelops he, and Pelops sire, holds, spite of pride, in close captivity. Beggars who of labor tire, called or uncalled, he hears and sets them free. Translator's Note Sons are hurrying, sons are west, and newborn moons make speed to meet their end. The thought seems to be that the rapid course of time hurrying men to the grave proves the wisdom of contentment and the folly of avarice. My version formerly did not express this, and I have altered it accordingly, while I have rendered Novae que pergunt interiore lunae closely, as Horace may perhaps have intended to speak of the moons as hastening to their graves as men do yet no hall that wealth e'er planned waits you more surely than the wider room traced by death's yet greedier hand fine is the instrumental ablative constructed with destinata which is itself an ablative agreeing with aula understood the rich man looks into the future and makes contracts which he may never live to see executed verse seventeen tu secanda marmora locas sub ipsum funus meantime death more punctual than any contractor more greedy than any encroaching proprietor has planned with his measuring line a mansion of a different kind which will infallibly be ready when the day arrives end of poem this recording is in the public domain Book Two, Ode Nineteen, Bacum in Remotis, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, February twenty-sixth, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Bacum in Remotis. 
bacchus i saw in mountain glades retired believe it after years teaching his strains to dryad maids while goat-hoofed satyrs pricked their ears evoy my eyes with terror glare my heart is revelling with the god tis madness evoy spare o oh spare dread wielder of the ivied rod yes i may sing the thyad crew the stream of wine the sparkling rills that run with milk and honey-dew that from the hollow trunk distills and i may sing thy consort's crown new set in heaven and pentheus hall with ruthless ruin thundering down and proud lycurgus funeral thou turnst the rivers thou the sea thou on far summits moist with wine thy bacchant tresses harmlessly dost not with living serpent twine thou when the giant's threatening rack were clambering up jove's citadel didst hurl o'er weening roitus back in tooth and claw a lion fell who knew thy feats in dance and play deemed thee belike for war's rough game unmeet but peace and battle fray found thee their centre still the same grim cerberus wagged his tail to see thy golden horn nor dreamed of wrong but gently fawning followed thee and licked thy feet with triple tongue End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section fifty seven, Book two, Ode twenty, Non Usitata, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Patty Marie. Non Usitata no vulgar wing nor weakly plied shall bear me through the liquid sky a two-formed bard no more to bide within the range of envy's eye mid haunts of men i all ungraced by gentle blood i whom you call your friend my canis shall not taste of death nor chafe in Lethe's thrall. E'en now a rougher skin expands along my legs. Above I change to a white bird, and o'er my hands and shoulders grows a plumage strange. Fleeter than Icarus see me float o'er Bosphorus, singing as I go, and o'er Gastulian sands remote, and Hyperborean fields of snow. By Dacian horde that masks its fear of Marsic steel shall I be known, and furthest Scythian. Spain shall know my warbling, and the banks of Rhone. No dirges for my fancied death, no weak lament, no mournful stave. All clamorous grief were waste of breath, and vain the tribute of a grave. Note, I whom you call your friend, my Canis, with Ritter I have rendered according to the interpretation which makes Delecte, my Canis addressed to Horace. But it is a choice of evils. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book three, Ode one, Ode Profanum by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, Vernal Equinox, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Odi profanum. I bid the unhallowed crowd avaunt, keep holy silence. Strains unknown till now, the muses hierophant, I sing to youths and maids alone. Kings o'er their flocks the sceptre wield, 
e'en kings beneath jove's sceptre bow victor in giant battlefield he moves all nature with his brow this man his planted walks extends beyond his peers an older name one to the people's choice commends one boasts a more unsullied fame one plumes him on a larger crowd of clients what are great or small death takes the mean man with the proud the fatal urn has room for all when guilty pomp the drawn sword sees hung o'er her richest feasts in vain strain their sweet juice her taste to please no lutes no singing birds again will bring her sleep sleep knows no pride it scorns not cots of village hinds nor shadow trembling riverside nor tempe stirred by western winds who having competence has all the tumult of the sea defies nor fears arcturus angry fall nor fears the kid stars sullen rise though hailstorms on the vineyard beat though crops deceive though trees complain one while of showers one while of heat one while of winter's barbarous rain fish feel the narrowing of the main from sunken piles while on the strand contractors with their busy train let down huge stones and lords of land affect the sea but fierce alarm can clamber to the master's side black cares can up the galley swarm and close behind the horsemen ride if phrygian marbles soothe not pain nor star-bright purples costliest wear nor vines of true falernian strain nor achaemenian spices rare why with rich gate and pillared range upbuild new mansions twice as high or why my sabine vale exchange for more laborious luxury translator's note and lords of land affect the sea terai of course goes with fastidiosus not with dominus mine is a loose rendering not a false interpretation end of poem this recording is in the public domain book three ode to angustam amice by horace translated by john connington read for librivox dot org by ross clayton palm sunday two k sixteen roebuck south carolina angustam amice to suffer hardness with good cheer in sternest school of warfare bred our youth should learn let steed and spear make him one day the parthians dread cold skies keen perils brace his life methinks i see from rampired town some battling tyrant's matron wife some maiden look in terror down ah my dear lord untrained in war oh tempt not the infuriate mood of that fell lion see from far he plunges through a tide of blood what joy for fatherland to die death's darts e'en flying feet o'ertake nor spare a recreant chivalry a back that cowers or loins that quake true virtue never knows defeat her robes she keeps unsullied still nor takes nor quits her curule seat to please a people's veering will true virtue opens heaven to worth she makes the way she does not find the vulgar crowd the humid earth her soaring pinion leaves behind sealed lips have blessings sure to come who drags elusis right to day that man shall never share my home or join my voyage roofs give way and boats are wrecked true men and thieves neglected justice oft confounds though vengeance halt she seldom leaves the wretch whose flying steps she hounds translator's note her robes she keeps unsullied still 
the meaning is not that worth is not disgraced by defeat in contests for worldly honours but that the honours which belong to worth are such as the worthy never fail to attain such as bring no disgrace along with them and such as the popular breath can neither confer nor resume true men and thieves neglected justice oft confounds Quote, the thieves have bound the true men unquote. shakespeare henry the fourth act two scene two where see stevens note end of poem this recording is in the public domain book three ode three eustum et tenachem by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, March 21st, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Eustum et Tenachim The man of firm and righteous will, no rabble clamorous for the wrong, no tyrant's brow whose frown may kill, can shake the strength that makes him strong not wind that chafe the sea they sway nor jove's right hand with lightning red should nature's pillared frame give way that wreck would strike one fearless head pollux and roving hercules thus won their way to heaven's proud steep mid whom augustus couched at ease dyes his red lips with nectar deep for this great bacchus tigers drew thy glorious car untaught to slave in harness thus quirinus flew on mars winged steed from acheron's wave when juno spoke with heaven's assent o oh, ilium ilium wretched town the judge accursed incontinent and stranger dame have dragged thee down Pallas and I, since Priam's sire denied the gods his pledged reward, had doomed them all to sword and fire, the people and their perjured lord. No more the adulterous guest can charm the Spartan queen. The house forsworn no more repels by Hector's arm my warriors, baffled and outworn. Hushed is the war our strife made long i welcome now my hatred o'er a grandson in the child of wrong him whom the trojan priestess bore receive him mars the gates of flame may open let him taste forgiven the nectar and enroll his name among the peaceful ranks of heaven let the wide waters sever still ilium and rome the exiled race may reign and prosper where they will so but in paris burial place the cattle sport the wild beasts hide their cubs the capital may stand all bright and rome in warlike pride o'er media stretch a conqueror's hand ay let her scatter far and wide her terror where the land-locked waves europe from Africa's shore divide where swelling nile the cornfield laves of strength more potent to disdain hid gold best buried in the mine than gather it with hand profane that for man's greed would rob a shrine whate'er the bound to earth ordained there let her reach the arm of power travelling where raves the fire unreined and where the storm cloud and the shower yet warlike roman know thy doom nor drunken with a conqueror's joy or blind with duteous zeal presume to build again ancestral troy should troy revive to hateful life her star again should set in gore while i jove's sister and his wife to victory led my host once more though phoebus thrice in brazen mail should case her towers they thrice should fall stormed by my greeks thrice wives should wail husband and son themselves in thrall 
such thunders from the lyre of love back wayward muse refrain refrain to tell the talk of gods above and dwarf high themes in puny string translator's note no more the adulterous guest can charm the spartan queen i have followed reiter in constructing lacaenae adulterae as a dative with splendet but i have done so as a poetical translator rather than as a commentator End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Three, Ode Four, Descende Kylo by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, March twenty-first, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Descende Kylo. Come down, Calliope, from above, breathe on the pipe a strain of fire. Or, if a graver note thou love, with Phoebus Citern and his lyre. You hear her? Or is this the play of fond illusion? Hark! Meseems through gardens of the good I stray, mid murmuring gales and purling streams. Me, as I lay on Volter's steep, a truant past apulia's bound or tired poor child with play and sleep with living green the stock doves crowned a legend nay a miracle by acherontia's nestlings told by all in bantine glade that dwell or till the rich forinton mould bears vipers spared him as he lay the sacred garland decked his hair the myrtle blended with the bay the child's inspired the gods were there your grace sweet muses shields me still on sabine heights or lets me range where cool prynesty tiber's hill or liquid bay proffers change me to your springs your dances true philippi bore not to the ground nor the doomed tree in falling slew nor billowy palinurus drowned grant me your presence blithe and fain mad bosporus shall my bark explore my foot shall tread the sandy plain that glows beside assyria's shore mid britain tribes the stranger's foe and spaniards drunk with horses blood and quivered scythians will i go unharmed and look on tanais flood when caesar's self in peaceful town the weary veteran's home has made you bid him lay his helmet down and rest in your pyurian shade mild thoughts you plant and joy to see mild thoughts take root the nations know how with descending thunder he the impious titans hurled below who rules dull earth and stormy seas and towns of men and realms of pain and gods and mortal companies alone impartial in his reign yet jove had feared the giant rush their upraised arms their port of pride and the twin brethren bent to push huge pelion up olympus side but typhon mimas what could these or what porphyrians stalwart scorn Rhetus, or he whose spears were trees in Celadus, from earth uptorn, as on they rushed in mad career gainst Pallas' shield. Here met the foe fierce Vulcan, queenly Juno here, and he who ne'er shall quit his bow, who laves in clear Castalian flood his locks, and loves the leafy growth of Lycia next his native wood, the Delian and the Patarn both strength mindless falls by its own weight strength mixed with mind is made more strong by the just gods who surely hate the strength whose thoughts are set on wrong let hundred-handed gaius bear his witness and orion known tempter of diane chaste and fair by diane's maiden dart o'erthrown 
hurled on the monstrous shapes she bred earth groans and mourns her children thrust to orcus etna's weight of lead keeps down the fire that breaks its crust still sits the bird on tityos breast the warder of unlawful love still suffers lewd pyrethous pressed by massive chains no hand may move translator's note or if a graver note than love with phoebus citern and his lyre i have followed horace's sense not his words i believe with ritter that the alternative is between the pipe as accompanying the vox acuta and the cythera or lyre as accompanying the vox gravis horace has specified the vox acuta and left the vox gravis to be inferred i have done just the reverse me as i lay on walter's steep in this and the two following stanzas i have paraphrased horace with a view to bring out what appears to be his sense there is i think a peculiar force in the word fabulosi standing as it does at the very opening of the stanza in close connection with me and thus bearing the weight of all the intervening words to the very end where its noun palumbes is introduced at last horace says in effect i too like other poets have a legend of my infancy accordingly i have thrown the gossip of the countryside into the form of an actual speech whether i am justified in heightening the marvellous by making the stock doves actually crown the child instead of merely laying branches upon him i am not so sure but something more seems to be meant than the covering of leaves which the children in the wood in our own legend receive from the robin loves the leafy growth of lycia next his native wood some of my predecessors seem hardly to distinguish between the lycii dumeta and the natalem silvam of delos apollo's attachments to both of which warrants the two titles delius et patareus i knew no better way of marking the distinction within the compass of a line and a half than by making apollo exhibit a preference where horace speaks of his likings as coordinate strength mixed with mind is made more strong mixed is not meant as a precise translation of temperatum chastened or restrained though to mix happens to be one of the shades of meaning of temperare end of poem this recording is in the public domain Book Three, Ode Five, Kylo Tonantem by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, March twenty-first, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Kylo Tonantem. Jove rules in heaven; his thunder shows. Henceforth, Augustus, Earth shall own her present God now britain foes and persians bow before his throne has crassus soldier tamed to wife a base barbarian and grown gray woe for a nation's tainted life earning his foemen kinsmen's pay his king forsooth a mead his sire a marcian can he name forget gown sacred shield undying fire and jove and rome are standing yet twas this that regulus foresaw what time he spurned the foul disgrace of peace whose precedent would draw destruction on an unborn race should aught but death the prisoner's chain unrivet i have seen he said rome's eagle in a punic fane and armour ne'er a blood drop shed stripped from the soldier i have seen free sons of rome with arms fast tied the fields we spoiled with corn or green and carthage opes her portals wide the warrior sure redeemed by gold will fight the bolder ah you heap on baseness loss 
the hues of old revisit not the wool we steep and genuine worth expelled by fear returns not to the worthless slave break but her meshes will the deer assail you then will he be brave who once to faithless foes has knelt yes carthage yet his spear will fly who with bound arms the cord has felt the coward and has feared to die he knows not he how life is won thinks war like peace a thing of trade great art thou carthage mate the sun while italy in dust is laid his wife's pure kiss he waved aside and prattling boys as one disgraced they tell us and with manly pride stern on the ground his visage placed with counsel thus ne'er else a red he nerved the father's weak intent and girt by friends that mourned him sped into illustrious banishment well witting what the torturer's art designed him with like unconcern the press of kin he pushed apart and crowds encumbering his return as though some tedious business or of client's court his journey lay towards venafrum's grassy floor or sparta built tarentum's bay translator's note the fields we spoiled with corn are green the later editors are right in not taking marte nostro with coli as well as with populata as has been remarked to me the pride of the roman is far more forcibly expressed by the complaint that the enemy have been able to cultivate fields that rome has ravaged than by the statement that roman captives have been employed to cultivate the fields they had ravaged as invaders the latter proposition it is true includes the former but the new matter draws off attention from the old and so weakens it who wants to faithless foes has knelt knelt is not strictly accurate expressing bentley's de dedit rather than the common and doubtless correct text credidi and girt by friends that mourned him sped the press of kin he pushed apart i had originally reversed amicos and propinquos supposing it to be indifferent which of them was used in either stanza but a friend has pointed out to me that a distinction is probably intended between the friends who attended regulus and the kinsmen who sought to prevent his going end of poem this recording is in the public domain book three ode six delicta majorum by horace translated by john conington Read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayta, February 26th to K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Delicta Maiorum Your father's guilt you still must pay, till, Roman, you restore each shrine, each temple mouldering in decay, and smoke-grimed statues scarce divine. Revering heaven you rule below, be that your base your coping still tis heaven neglected bids o'erflow the measure of italian ill now pacorus and monices twice have given our unblessed arms the foil their necklaces of mean device smiling they deck with roman spoil our city torn by factions throws dacian and ethiop well nigh raised these with their dreadful navy those for archer prowess rather praise an evil age erewhile debased the marriage bed the race the home thence rose the flood whose waters waste the nation and the name of rome not such their birth who stained for us the sea with punic carnage red smote pyrrhus smote antiochus and hannibal the romans dread theirs was a hardy soldier brood inured all day the land to till with sabine spade then shoulder wood hewn at a stern old mother's will 
when sunset lengthened from each height the shadows and unyoked the steer restoring in its westward flight the hour to toil-worn travel dear what has not cankering time made worse viler than grandsires sires begat ourselves yet baser soon to curse the world with offspring baser yet End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Three, Ode Seven, Quid Fles Asteriae, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayte, February twenty seventh, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Quid Fles Asteriae. Why weep for him, whom sweet Favonian airs will waft next spring, Asteria, back to you, rich with Bithynia's wares, a lover fond and true, your Gyges? He, detained by stormy stress at Oricum, about the goat star's rise, cold, wakeful, comfortless, the long night weeping lies. Meantime, his lovesick hostess messenger, Talks of the flames that waste poor Chloe's heart, Flames lit for you, not her, with a besieger's art, Shows how a treacherous woman's lying breath, Once on a time on trustful Proetus, Won to doom to early death to chaste Bellerophon, Warns him of Peleus' peril, All but slain for virtuous scorn of fair Hippolyta, And tells again each tale that e'er led heart astray in vain for deafer than icarian seas he hears untainted yet but lady fair what if enipeus please your listless eye beware though true it be that none with surer seat or mars grassy turf is seen to ride nor any swims so fleet down the tuscan tide yet keep each evening door and window barred Look not abroad when music strikes up shrill, And though he call you hard, remain obdurate still. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Three, Ode Eight, Martise Coilebs, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org, by Ross Clayton, March 15th, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Martise Coilebs The first of March, a man unwed. What can these flowers, this censer, mean, or what these embers, glowing red on sods of green? you ask in either language skilled a feast i vowed to bacchus free a white he-goat when all but killed by falling tree so when that holy day comes round it sees me still the rosin clear from this my wine jar first embrowned in tullus year come crush one hundred cups for life preserved my Cenus keep till day the candles lit let noise and strife be far away lay down that load of state concern the dacian hosts are all o'erthrown the mead that sought our overturn now seeks his own a servant now our ancient foe the spaniard wears at last our chain the scythian half unbends his bow and quits the plain then fret not lest the state should ail a private man such thoughts may spare enjoy the present hours regale and banish care translator's note lay down that load of state concern i have translated generally but horace's meaning is special referring to mycenaeus office of prefect of the city End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Three, Ode Nine, Donec Gratus Eram, 
by Horace, translated by John Connington. Read for LibriVox.org. Lydia, read by Sonia. Horace, read by Ross Clayton. Donic gratus eram. While I had power to bless you, nor any round that neck his arms did fling, more privileged to caress you, happier was Horace than the Persian king. While you for none were pining, Sora, nor Lydia after Chloe came, Lydia, her peers outshining, might match her own with Ilia's Roman fame. Now Chloe is my treasure, whose voice, whose touch can make sweet music flow, for her I'd die with pleasure, would fate but spare the dear survivor so. I love my own fond lover, young Calais, son of Thurian Ornitus. For him I'd die twice over, would fate but spare the sweet survivor thus. What now, if love, returning, should pair us neath his brazen yoke once more, and, bright-haired Chloe spurning, Horace to off-cast Lydia ope his door. Though he is fairer, milder than starlight, you lighter than bark of tree, than stormy Hadria wilder, with you to live to die were bliss for me. Translator's Note Butman complains of the editors for specifying the interlocutors as Horace and Lydia, which he thinks as incongruous as if in an English Amabian ode, Collins were to appear side by side with Phyllis. The remark may be just as affects the Latin. Though Ode 19 of the present book and Odes 33 and 36 of Book 1 might be adduced to show that Horace does not object to mixing Latin and Greek names in the same poem. But it does not apply to translation, where, to the English reader's apprehension, Horace and Lydia will seem equally real, equally fanciful. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book 3, Ode 10 Extremum Tanaim by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, February 28, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Extremum Tanaim Alike, though your drink were Tanais, your husband some rude savage, you would weep to leave me shivering on a night like this where storms their watches keep hark how your door is creaking how the grove in your fair courtyard while the wild winds blow wails in accord with what transparence jove is glazing the driven snow cease that proud temper venus loves it not the rope may break the wheel may backward turn Begetting you, no Tuscan sire begot Penelope the stern. Oh, though no gift, no prevalence of prayer, nor lover's paleness deep as violet, nor husband smit with a Pyrian fair, move you, have pity yet. O oh, harder e'en than toughest heart of oak, deferred than uncharmed snake to suppliant moans. This side, I warn you, will not always brook rain, water, and cold stones. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Three, Ode Eleven, Mercuri Nam Te, by Horace, translated by John Connington. Read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, February 29th, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Mercury Nam Te Come, Mercury, by whose minstrel spell Amphion raised the Theban stones, Come with thy seven sweet strings, my shell, Thy diver stones, nor vocal once nor pleasant now to rich man's board and temple dear put forth thy power to lead a bow her stubborn ear 
she like a three-year colt unbroke is frisking o'er the spacious plain too shy to bear a lover's yoke a husband's reign the wood the tiger at thy call have followed thou canst rivers stay the monstrous guard of pluto's hall to thee gave way grim cerberus round whose gorgon head a hundred snakes are hissing death whose triple jaws black venom shed and sickening breath ixion too and tityos smoothed their rugged brows the urn stood dry one hour while danaus maids were soothed with minstrelsy let leda hear those maidens guilt their famous doom the ceaseless drain of outpoured water ever spilt and all the pain reserved for sinners e'en when dead those impious hands could crime do more those impious hands had hearts to shed their bridegroom's gore one only true to hymen's flame was traitress to her sire forsworn that splendid falsehood lights her name through times unborn wake to her youthful spouse she cried wake or you yet may sleep too well fly from the father of your bride her sisters fell they as she lines bullocks rend tear each her victim i less hard than these will slay you not poor friend nor hold in ward me let my sire in fetters lay for mercy to my husband shown me let him ship far hence away to climes unknown go speed your flight o'er land and wave while night and venus shield you go be blessed and on my tomb engrave this tale of woe end of poem this recording is in the public domain Book Three, Ode Twelve, Miserarum Est, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, February twenty ninth, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Miserarum Est. How unhappy are the maidens who with Cupid may not play, who may never touch the wine cup but must tremble all the day at an uncle and the scourging of his tongue neoble there's a robber takes your needle and your thread lets the lessons of minerva run no longer in your head it is hebrus the athletic and the young oh to see him when anointed he is plunging in the flood what a seat he has on horseback was bellerophon's as good as a boxer as a runner past compare when the deer are flying blindly all the open country o'er he can aim and he can hit them he can steal upon the boar as it couches in the thicket unaware end of poem this recording is in the public domain Section 70, Book 3, Ode 13, O Fons Spandusii, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Patty Marie. O Fons Spandusii, Bandusia's font, in clearness crystalline, O worthy of the wine, the flowers we vow. Tomorrow shall be thine a kid, whose crescent brow is sprouting all for love and victory. In vain, his warm red blood so early stirred, thy gelid stream shall die, child of the wanton herd. Thee, the fierce Sirian star, to madness fired, forbears to touch sweet cool thy waters yield to ox with ploughing tired and lazy sheep afield thou too one day shall win proud eminence mid honoured founts while i the ilex sing 
crowning the cavern whence thy babbling wavelets spring. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book 3, Ode 14, Hercules Ritu by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clay to February 29th, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Hercules Ritu Our Hercules, they told us Rome, had sought the laurel death bestows. Now glory brings him conqueror home from Spaniard foes proud of her spouse the imperial fair must thank the gods that shield from death his sister too let matrons wear the suppliant wreath for daughters and for sons restored ye youths and damsels newly wed let decent awe restrain each word best left unsaid this day true holy day to me shall banish care I will not fear rude broils or bloody death to see while Caesar's here. Quick, boy, the chaplets and the nard and wine that knew the Marcian war, or if roving Spartacus have spared a single jar. And bid Neera come and trill her bright locks bound with careless art. If her rough porter cross your will, why then depart soon palls the taste for noise and fray when hair is white and leaves are sere how had i fired in life's warm may in plancus year end of poem this recording is in the public domain book three ode fifteen uxor pauperis ibiki by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, March 2nd, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Uxor Pauperis Ibiki Wife of Ibicus the poor, let aged sandals have at length their bound. Give your graceless doings o'er, ripe as you are for going underground you the maidens dance to lead and cast your gloom upon those beaming stars daughter foloi may succeed but mother chloris what she touches mars young men's homes your daughter storms like thyad maddened by the cymbals beat nothus love her bosom warms she gambles like a fawn with silver feet yours should be the wool that grows by fair lucaria not the merry lute flowers beseem not withered brows nor withered lips with emptied wine jars suit end of poem this recording is in the public domain book three ode sixteen inclusum danain by horace Translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayta, March 4th, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Inclusum Danae Full well had Danae been secured in truth by oaken portals and a brazen tower and savage watchdogs from the roving youth that prowl at midnight's hour but jove and venus mocked with gay disdain the jealous warder of that close stronghold the way they knew must soon be smooth and plain when gods could change to gold 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 can pass the tyrant's sentinel can shiver rocks with more resistless blow than is the thunders argus prophet fell he and his house laid low and all for gain the man of macedon cleft gates of cities rival kings o'erthrew by force of gifts their cunning snares have won rude captains and their crew as riches grow care follows men repine and thirst for more 
no lofty crest i raise wisdom that thought forbids my senus mine the knightly order's praise he that denies himself shall gain the more from bounteous heaven i strip me of my pride desert the rich man's standard and pass o'er to bear contentment's side more proud as lord of what the great despised than if the wheat threshed on apulia's floor i hoarded all in my huge granaries mid vast possessions poor a clear fresh stream a little field o'ergrown with shady trees a crop that ne'er deceives pass though men know it not their wealth that own all Africa's golden sheaves though no calabrian bees their honey yield for me nor mellowing sleeps the god of wine in formian jar nor in gaul's pasture field the wool grows long and fine yet poverty ne'er comes to break my peace if more i craved you would not more refuse desiring less i better shall increase my tiny revenues than if to eleates wide domains i joined the realms of migdom great desires sort with great wants tis best when prayer obtains no more than life requires end of poem this recording is in the public domain Book Three, Ode Seventeen, I Leave It to Stow, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clay, to March Fourth to K Sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. I Leave It to Stow. Ilius, of Lamus' ancient name, for since from that high parentage the prehistoric Lamias came, and all who filled the storied page no doubt you trace your line from him who stretched his sway o'er formiae and lyris whose still waters swim where green marica skirts the sea lord of broad realms an eastern gale will blow to-morrow and bestrew the shore with weeds with leaves the veil if rain's old prophet tell me true the raven gather while tis fine your wood Tomorrow shall be gay with smoking pig and streaming wine, and lord and slave keep holiday. Translator's note Lamia was doubtless vain of his pedigree. Horace accordingly banters him good humouredly by spending two stanzas out of four in giving him his proper ancestral designation. To shorten the address by leaving out a stanza, as some critics and some translators have done, is simply to rob Horace's trifle of its point. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Three, Ode Eighteen, Fauna Nympharum, by Horace, translated by John Connington. Read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, March 4th, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Faune Nymphatum O oh, want the flying nymphs to woo, good Faunus, Through my sunny farm pass gently, gently pass, Nor do my younglings harm. Each year, thou know'st, a kid must die for thee, nor lacks the wine's full stream to venus mate the bowl and high the altars steam sure as december's nones appear all o'er the grass the cattle play the village with the lazy steer keeps holy day wolves rove among the fearless sheep the woods for thee their foliage strow the delver loves on earth to leap his ancient foe. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Three, Ode Nineteen, Quantum Distat, by Horace, translated by John Conington, 
Read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, March 7th, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Quantum Distat What the time from Inachos to Codrus, who in patriot battle fell? Who were sprung from Iacus, and how men fought at Ilion? This you tell. What the wines of Chios cost, who with due heat our water can allay what the hour and who the host to give us house-room this you will not say ho oh, there wine to moonrise wine to midnight wine to our new augur too nine to three or three to nine as each man pleases makes proportion true who the uneven muses loves will fire his dizzy brain with three times three three once told the grace approves she with her two bright sisters gay and free shrinks as maiden should from strife but i'm for madness what has dulled the fire of the barasindian fife why hangs the flute in silence with the lyre out on niggard-handed boys rain showers of roses let old Lycus hear, envious churl, our senseless noise, and she, our neighbor, his ill-sorted fear. You with your bright clustering hair, your beauty, Telephus, like evening sky, Rhoda loves as young as fair. I, for my Glycera, slowly, slowly die. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Three, Ode Twenty One, O Nata Mecum, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, March Eighth, Two K Sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. O Nata Mecum. O born in Manlius, year with me, whate'er you bring us, plaint or jest, or passion and wild revelry or like a gentle wine-jar rest howe'er men call your massic juice its broaching claims a festal day come then corvinus bids produce a mellower wine and i obey though steeped in all socratic lore he will not slight you do not fear they say old cato o'er and o'er with wine his honest heart would cheer Tough wits to your mild torture yield their treasures. You unlock the soul of wisdom and its stores concealed, armed with Laia's kind control. Tis yours the drooping heart to heal, your strength uplifts the poor man's horn, inspired by you the soldier's steel, the monarch's crown he laughs to scorn. Liber and Venus wills she so, and sister graces ne'er unknit, and living lamps shall see you flow till stars before the sunrise flit. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Three, Ode Twenty Two, Montium Custos by Horace, translated by John Conington. Read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, March 8, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Montium Custos Guardian of hill and woodland, maid, who to young wives in childbirth's hour thrice called vouchsafest sovereign aid, O three-formed power, this pine that shades my cot be thine here will i slay as years come round a youngling boar whose tusks design the sidelong wound end of poem this recording is in the public domain book three ode twenty three coilo supinas by horace translated by john conington Read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, March 8, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Coilosupinas 
if fidele your hands you lift to heaven as each new moon is born soothing your lares with the gift of slaughtered swine and spice and corn ne'er shall sirocco's bane assail your vines nor mildew blast your wheat ne'er shall your tender younglings fail in autumn when the fruits are sweet the destined victim mid the snows of algidus in oak woods fed or where the alban herbage grows shall die the pontiff's axes red no need of butchered sheep for you to make your homely prayers prevail give but your little gods their due the rosemary twined with myrtle frail the sprinkled salt the votive meal as soon their favour will regain let but the hand be pure and leal as all the pomp of heifers slain translator's note there is something harsh in the expression of the fourth stanza of this ode in the latin tentare cannot stand without an object and to connect it as the commentators do with deos is awkward i was going to remark that possibly some future bentley would conjecture certare or litare when i found that certare had been anticipated by perlkamp who if not a bentley was a bentleyan but it would not be easy to account for the corruption as the fact that the previous line begins with kerwike would rather have led to the change of tentare into kertare than vice versa End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book three, Ode twenty four, Intactis Opulentior, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clay to March tenth, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Intactis Opulentior though your buried wealth surpass the unsunned gold of ind or araby though with many a ponderous mass you crowd the tuscan and apulian sea let necessity but drive her wedge of adamant into that proud head vainly battling will you strive to escape death's noose or rid your soul of dread better life the scythians lead trailing on wagon wheels their wandering home or the hardy geton breed as o'er their vast unmeasured steppes they roam free the crops that bless their soil their tillage wearies after one year's space each in turn fulfils his toil his period o'er another takes his place there the step-dame keeps her hand from guilty plots from blood of orphans clean there no dowried wives command their feeble lords or on adulterers lean theirs are dowries not of gold their parents worth their own pure chastity true to one to others cold they dare not sin or if they dare they die o oh, whoe'er has heart and head to stay our plague of blood our civic brawls would he that his name be read father of rome on lofty pedestals let him chain this lawless will and be our children's hero cursed spite living worth we envy still then seek it with strained eyes when snatched from sight what can sad laments avail unless sharp justice kill the taint of sin what can laws that needs must fail shorn of the aid of manners formed within if the merchant turns not back from the fierce heat that round the tropic glow turns not from the regions black with northern winds and hard with frozen snow sailors override the wave while guilty poverty more feared than vice bids us crime and suffering brave and shuns the ascent of virtue's precipice let the capitolian fane the favoured goal of yon vociferous crowd ay or let the nearest main receive our gold our jewels rich and proud slay we thus the cause of crime if yet we would repent and choose the good 
ours the task to take in time this baleful lust and crush it in the bud ours to mould our weakling sons to nobler sentiment and manlier deed now the noble's first-born shuns the perilous chase nor learns to sit his steed set him to the unlawful dice or grecian hoop how skilfully he plays while his sire mature in vice a friend a partner or a guest betrays hurrying for an heir so base to gather riches money root of ill doubt it not still grows apace yet the scant heap has somewhat lacking still translator's note let necessity but drive her wedge of adamant into that proud head i have translated this difficult passage nearly as it stands not professing to decide whether tops of buildings or human heads are meant either is strange till explained neither seems at present to be supported by any exact parallel in ancient literature or ancient art necessity with her nails has met us before in ode thirty five of book one and aurelli describes an etruscan work of art where she is represented with that cognizance but though the nail is an appropriate emblem of fixity we are apparently not told where it is to be driven the difficulty here is further complicated by the following metaphor of the noose which seems to be a new and inconsistent image end of poem this recording is in the public domain book three ode twenty five quo me bacche by horace translated by john connington read for librivox dot org by ross clayton march tenth two k sixteen roebuck south carolina quo me bacche whither bacchus tearst thou me filled with thy strength what dens what forests these thus in wildering race i see what cave shall hearken to my melodies tuned to tell of caesar's praise and throne him high the heavenly ranks among sweet and strange shall be my lays a tale till now by poet voice unsung as the evian on the height roused from her sleep looks wonderingly abroad looks on thrace with snowdrifts white and rhodope by barbarous footstep trod so my truant eyes admire the banks the desolate forests o great king who the naiads dost inspire and bacchants strong from earth huge trees to ring not a lowly strain is mine no mere man's utterance o oh, tis venture sweet thee to follow god of wine making the vine branch round thy temples meet End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book three, Ode twenty six, Wixi Puelis by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox dot org by Ross Clayton, March tenth to K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Wixi Puelis for ladies love i late was fit and good success my warfare blessed but now my arms my lyre i quit and hang them up to rust or rest here where arising from the sea stands venus lay the load at last links crowbars and artillery threatening all doors that dare to be fast o oh, goddess cypress owns thy sway and memphis far from thracian snow raise high thy lash and deal me pray that haughty chloe just one blow end of poem this recording is in the public domain book three ode twenty seven impios parai by horace translated by john conington read for librivox dot org by ross clayton march tenth two k sixteen roebuck south carolina impios parai when guilt goes forth let lapwings shrill and dogs and foxes great with young 
and wolves from far lanuvian hill give clamorous tongue across the roadway dart the snake frightening like arrow loosed from string the horses i for friendship's sake watching each wing ere to his haunt the stagnant marsh the harbinger of tempest flies will call the raven croaking harsh from eastern skies farewell and wheresoe'er you go my galatea think of me let left-hand pie and roving crow still leave you free but mark with what a front of fear orion lowers ah well i know how hadria glooms how falsely clear the west winds blow let foemen's wives and children feel the gathering south wind's angry roar the black waves crash the thunder peal the quivering shore so to the bull europa gave her beauteous form and when she saw the monstrous deep the awning grave grew pale with awe that morn of meadow flowers she thought weaving a crown the nymphs to please that gloomy night she looked on naught but stars and seas then as in hundred cityed crete she landed o oh, my sire she said o oh, childly duty passion's heat has struck thee dead whence came i death for maiden shame were little do i wake to weep my sin or am i pure of blame and is it sleep from dreamland brings a form to trick my senses which was best to go over the long long waves or pick the flowers in blow oh were that monster made my prize how would i strive to wound that brow how tear those horns my frantic eyes adored but now shameless i left my father's home shameless i cheat the expectant grave o oh, heaven that naked i might roam in lion's cave now ere decay my bloom devour or thin the richness of my blood fain would i fall in youth's first flower the tiger's food hark tis my father worthless one what yet alive the oak is nigh twas well you kept your maiden zone the noose to tie or if your choice be that rude pike new barbed with death leap down and ask the wind to bear you would you like the bondmaid's task you child of kings a master's toy a mistress slave beside her low stood venus smiling and her boy with unstrung bow then when her laughter ceased have done with hume and fret she cried my fair that odious bull will give you soon his horns to tear you know not you are jove's own dame away with sobbing be resigned to greatness you shall give your name to half mankind End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book three, Ode twenty eight, Festo quid potius by Horace, translated by John Conington. Read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, March tenth, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Festo quid potius. Neptune's feast day what should man think first of doing lead a mine be bold broach the treasured kaikuban and batter wisdom in her own stronghold now the noon has passed the full yet sure you deem swift time has made a halt tardy as you are to pull old bibulous wine jar from its sleepy vault i will take my turn and sing neptune in near you strain with locks of green you shall warble to the string latona and her cynthia's arrowy sheen hers our latest song who sways nidos and cyclids and to paphos goes with her swans on holidays night too shall claim the homage music owes end of poem this recording is in the public domain Book three, Ode twenty nine, Tirena Regum, 
by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, March 11, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Tyrrhena Regum Heir of Tyrrhenian kings, for you a mellow cask, unbroached as yet, Mycenaeus mine, and roses new, and fresh-drawn oil your locks to wet are waiting here. Delay not still, nor gaze on Tiber never dried, and sloping Isole, and the hill of Telegon the parricide. O oh, leave that pomp that can but tire, those piles among the clouds at home. Cease for a moment to admire the smoke, the wealth, the noise of Rome. In change, e'en luxury finds a zest, the poor man's supper, neat but spare, with no gay couch to seat the guest, has smoothed the rugged brow of care. Now glows the Ethiop maiden's sire, now Procyon rages all ablaze, the lion maddens in his ire, as suns bring back the sultry days. The shepherd with his weary sheep seeks out the streamlet and the trees, Sylvanus lair. The still banks sleep untroubled by the wandering breeze. You ponder on imperial schemes, and o'er the city's danger brood. Bactrian and Syrian haunt your dreams, and Tanais tossed by inward feud. The issue of the time to be heaven wisely hides in blackest night, and laughs should man's anxiety transgress the bounds of man's short sight. Control the present, all beside flows like a river seaward borne, now rolling on its placid tide, now whirling massy trunks uptorn, and wave-worn crags and farms and stock in chaos blent, where hill and wood reverberate to the enormous shock, when savage rains the tranquil flood have stirred to madness. Happy he, self-centered, who each night can say, My life is lived. The morn may see a clouded or a sunny day, that rests with Jove. But what is gone he will not, cannot turn to naught, nor cancel as a thing undone what once the flying hour has brought. Fortune, who loves her cruel game, still bent upon some heartless whim, shifts her caresses, fickle dame, now kind to me and now to him. She stays, tis well, but let her shake those wings, her presence I resign, cloak me in native worth, and take chaste poverty undowered for mine. Though storms around my vessel rave, I will not fall to craven prayers, nor bargain by my vows to save my Cyprian and Sidonian wares, else added to the insatiate main. Then through the wild Aegean roar the breezes, and the brethren twain shall waft my little boat ashore. Translator's Note Nor gaze on Tiber never dried, with Ritter I have connected Semper Udum, an interpretation first suggested by Tate, who turned Ne into Ut, but I do not press it as the best explanation of the Latin. The general effect of the stanza is the same either way. Those piles among the clouds at home? I have understood Molem generally of the buildings of Rome, not especially of Mycenaeus Tower. The parallel passage in Virgil's Aeneid, one four hundred twenty-one. Miratur molem Aeneas magalia condam, miratur porta strepitumque et strata viarum. Is in favor of the former view. What once the flying hour has brought, I have followed Ritter doubtfully. Compare Virgil's Georgics, one four hundred sixty-one. Quid vesper serus wehat. Shall waft my little boat ashore. I have hardly brought out the sense of the Latin with sufficient clearness. Horace says that if adversity comes upon him, he shall accept it, and be thankful for what is left him, like a traitor in a tempest, who, instead of wasting time in useless prayers for the safety of his goods, takes at once to the boat and preserves his life. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Three, Ode Thirty, Exegi Monumentum by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, March twelfth, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Exegi Monumentum. And now tis done more durable than brass my monument shall be and raise its head o'er royal pyramids it shall not dread corroding rain or angry boreas nor the long lapse of immemorial time i shall not wholly die large residue shall scape the queen of funerals ever new my after fame shall grow while pontiffs climb with silent maids the capitolian height born men will say where aufidas is loud where daunus scant of streams beneath him bowed the rustic tribes from dimness he waxed bright first of his race to wed the aeolian lay to notes of italy put glory on my own melpomene by genius one and crown me of thy grace with Delphic Bay. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Four, Ode One, Inter Missa Venus by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Inter Missa Venus. Yet again thou wakes the flame that long had slumbered. Spare me, Venus, spare. Trust me, I am not the same as in the reign of Sinara, kind and fair. Cease thy softening spells to prove on this old heart, by fifty years made heart, cruel mother of sweet love. Haste where gay youth solicits thy regard. With thy purple signets fly to Paula's door, a seasonable guest. There within hold revelry, there light thy flame in that congenial breast. He with birth and beauty graced, the trembling client's champion, never tongue-tied, master of each manly taste, shall bear thy conquering banners far and wide. Let him smile in triumph gay, true heart, victorious over lavish hand, by the Alban lake that day, neath citron roof all marble shalt thou stand. Incense there and fragrant spice, with odorous fumes thy nostril shall salute. Blended notes thine ear entice, the lyre, the pipe, the barasintine flute. Graceful youths and maidens bright shall twice a day thy tuneful praise resound, while their feet so fair and white in salient measure three times beat the ground. I can relish love no more, nor flattering hopes that tell me hearts are true, nor the revel's loud uproar, nor fresh wreathed flowerets, bathed in vernal dew ah but why my ligurine steal trickling tear-drops down my wasted cheek wherefore halts this tongue of mine so eloquent once so faltering now and weak now i hold you in my chain and clasp you close all in a nightly dream now still dreaming over the plain i chase you now ah cruel down the stream end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Book Four, Ode Two, Pindarum Quis Quis, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, Purim, Two K Sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Pindarum Quis Quis. Who fain at Pindar's flight would aim? On waxen wings, you lose, he soars heavenward, doomed to give his name to some new sea. Pindar, like a torrent from the steep, which, swollen with rain, its banks o'erflows, with mouth unfathomably deep, foams, thunders, glows, all worthy of Apollo's bay, whether in dithyrambic roll, pouring new words he burst away beyond control, or gods and god-born heroes tell whose arm with righteous death could tame grim centaurs tame chimeras fell outbreathing flame 
or bid the boxer or the steed in deathless pride of victory live and dower them with a nobler meed than sculptors give or mourn the bridegroom early torn from his young bride and set on high strength courage virtue's golden morn too good to die antonius yes the winds blow free when Dirce's swan ascends the skies to waft him i like matine be in act and guise that calls its sweets through toilsome hours am roaming tiber's banks along and fashioning with puny powers a laboured song your muse shall sing in loftier strain how caesar climbs the sacred height the fierce sigambrians in his train with laurel dight than whom the fates ne'er gave mankind a richer treasure or more dear nor shall though earth again should find the golden year your muse shall tell of public sports and holy day and votive feast for caesar's sake and brawling courts where strife has ceased then if my voice can aught avail grateful for him our prayers have won my song shall echo hail all hail auspicious sun there as you move ho triumph ho great triumph once and yet again all rome shall cry and spices strow before your train ten bulls ten kine your debt discharge a calf new weaned from parent cow battening on pastures rich and large shall quit my vow like moon just dawning on the night the crescent honors of his head one dapple spot of snowy white the rest all red translator's note and spices strow before your train i had written and gifts bestow at every fane but ritter is doubtless right in explaining da vimos tura of the burning of incense in the streets during the procession about the early part of the stanza i am less confident but the explanation which makes antonius take part in the procession as praetor the reading adopted being tuque dum procedis is perhaps the least of evils end of poem this recording is in the public domain Book Four, Ode Three, Quem Tu Melpomene, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, Monday, Thursday, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Quem Tu Melpomene. He whom thou, Melpomene, hast welcomed with thy smile, in life arriving ne'er by boxer's skill shall be renowned abroad for isthmian mastery striving him shall never fiery steed draw an achaean car a conqueror seated him shall never martial deed show crowned with bay after proud kings defeated climbing capitolian steep but the cool streams that make green tiber flourish and the tangled forest deep on soft aeolian airs his fame shall nourish rome of cities first and best deigned by her son's according voice to hail me fellow bard of poets blest and faint and fainter envy's growls assail me goddess whose pyrian art the lyre's sweet sounds can modulate and measure who to dumb fish canst impart the music of the swan if such thy pleasure oh tis all of thy dear grace that every finger points me out in going lyrist of the roman race breath power to charm if mine are thy bestowing translator's note on soft aeolian airs his fame shall nourish horace evidently means that the scenery of tiber contributes to the formation of lyric genius it is wordsworth's doctrine in the germ though if the author had been asked what it involved perhaps he would not have gone further than ritter 
who resolves it all into the conduciveness of a pleasant retreat to successful composition end of poem this recording is in the public domain book four ode four qualem ministrum by horace translated by john conington read for librivox dot org by ross clayton good friday two k sixteen roebuck south carolina qualem ministrum e'en as the lightning's minister whom jove o'er all the feathered breed made sovereign having proved him sure erewhile on auburn ganymede stirred by warm youth and inborn power he quits the nest with timorous wing for winter storms have ceased to lower and zephyrs of returning spring tempt him to launch on unknown skies next on the fold he stoops downright last on resisting serpents flies a thirst for foray and for flight as tender kidling on the grass espies up looking from her food a lion's whelp and knows the lass those new-set teeth shall drink her blood so looked the rhetian mountaineers on drusus whence in every field they learned through immemorial years the amazonian axe to wield i ask not now not all of truth we seekers find enough to know the wisdom of the princely youth has taught our erst victorious foe what prowess dwells in boyish hearts reared in the shrine of a pure home what strength augustus love imparts to nero's seed the hope of rome good sons and brave good sires approve strong bullocks fiery colts attest their father's worth nor weakling dove is hatched in savage eagle's nest but care draws forth the power within and cultured minds are strong for good let manners fail the plague of sin taints e'en the course of gentle blood how great thy debt to nero's race o rome let red metaurus say slain hasdrubal and victory's grace first granted on that glorious day which chased the clouds and showed the sun when hannibal o'er italy ran as swift flames o'er pine woods run or eurus o'er sicilia's sea henceforth by fortune aiding toil rome's prowess grew her fanes laid waste by punic sacrilege and spoil beheld at length their gods replaced then the false libyan owned his doom weak dear the wolf's predestined prey blindly we rush on foes from whom twere triumph won to steal away that race which strong from Ilion's fires its gods on tuscan waters tossed its sons its venerable sires bore to ausonia's cityed coast that race like oak by axes shorn on algidus with dark leaves rife laughs carnage havoc all to scorn and draws new spirit from the knife not the lopped hydra tasked so sore alcides chafing at the foil no pest so fell was born of yore from caucian or from theban soil plunged in the deep it mounts to sight more splendid grappled it will quail unbroken powers and fight a fight whose story widowed wives shall tell no heralds shall my deeds proclaim to carthage now lost lost is all a nation's hope a nation's name they died with dying hasdrubal what will not claudian hands achieve jove's favor is their guiding star and watchful potencies unweave for them the tangled paths of war translator's note i have deranged the symmetry of the two opening similes making the eagle the subject of the sentence in the first the kid in the second an awkwardness which the latin is able to avoid by its power of distinguishing cases by inflection i trust however that it will not offend an english reader whence in every field they learned horace seems to allude jokingly to some unseasonable inquiry into the antiquity of the armor of these alpine tribes 
which had perhaps been started by some less skilful celebrator of the victory at the same time that he gratifies his love of lyrical commonplace by a parenthetical digression in the style of pindar and watchful potencies unweave for them the tangled paths of war on the whole ritter seems right after akron in understanding curai sagaces of the councils of augustus whom horace compliments similarly in the fourteenth ode of this book as the real author of his stepson's victories he is certainly right in giving the stanza to horace not to hannibal even a courtly or patriotic roman would have shrunk from the bad taste of making the great historical enemy of italy conclude his lamentation over his own and his country's deep sorrow by a flattering prophecy of the greatness of his antagonist's family End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book Four, Ode Five, Divis Orte Bonis, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, March twenty ninth, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Divis Orte Bonis. Best guardian of Rome's people, dearest boon of a kind heaven, thou lingerest all too long thou bad'st thy senate look to meet thee soon do not thy promise wrong restore dear chief the light thou takest away ah when like spring that gracious mien of thine dawns on thy rome more gently glides the day and suns serener shine see her whose darling child a long year past has dwelt beyond the wild carpathian foam that long year o'er the envious southern blast still bars him from his home weeping and praying to the shore she clings nor ever thence her straining eyesight turns so smit by loyal passion's restless stings rome for her caesar yearns in safety range the cattle o'er the mead sweet peace soft plenty swell the golden grain o'er unvexed seas the sailors blithely speed fair honour shrinks from stain no guilty lusts the shrine of home defile cleansed is the hand without the heart within the father's features in his children smile swift vengeance follows sin who fears the parthian or the scythian horde or the rank growth of german forests yield while caesar lives who trembles at the sword the fierce iberians wield in his own hills each labors down the day teaching the vine to clasp the widowed tree then to his cups again where feasting gay he hails his god in thee a household power adored with prayers and wine thou reign'st auspicious o'er his hour of ease thus grateful greece her castor made divine and her great hercules ah be it thine long holidays to give to thy hesperia thus dear chief we pray at sober sunrise thus at mellow eve when ocean hides the day end of poem this recording is in the public domain Book Four, Ode Six, Divi Quem Proles by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, March twenty ninth, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Divi Quem Proles. Thou who didst make thy vengeful might to Niobe and Tityos known, and Peleus son when troy's tall height was nigh his own victorious else for thee no peer though strong in his sea parent's power he shook with that tremendous spear the darden tower he like a pine by axes sped or cypress swayed by angry gust fell ruining and laid his head in trojan dust not his to lie in covert pent of the false steed 
and sudden fall on priam's ill-starred merriment in bower and hall his ruthless arm in broad bare day the infant from the breast had torn nay given to flame ah well away the babe unborn but won by venus voice and thine relenting jove aeneas willed with other omens more benign new walls to build sweet tuner of the grecian lyre whose locks are laved in xanthus dews blooming aguyeus help inspire my daunian muse tis phoebus phoebus gifts my tongue with minstrel art and minstrel fires come noble youths and maidens sprung from noble sires blessed in your dian's guardian smile whose shafts the flying sylvans stay come foot the lesbian measure while the lyre i play sing of latona's glorious boy sing of night's queen with crescent horn who wings the fleeting months with joy and swells the corn and happy brides shall say twas mine when years the cyclic season brought to chant the festal hymn divine by horace taught End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book four, Old Sever, De Fugere Nues by Horace. Translated by John Cunnington. Read for LibriVox.org by Livia. De Fugere Nues. The snow is fled, the trees their leaves put on the fields their green earth owns the change and the rivers a lessening run their banks between naked the nymphs and graces in the midst the dance essay now scaping death proclaims the air that speeds this sweet spring day frosts yield to zephyrs summer drives out spring to vanish when rich autumn sheds his fruits round winds the ring winter again yet the swift moons repair heaven's detriment with soon as trust where good aeneas tullus ancus went what are we dust can hope assure you one more day to live from powers above you rescue from your air whate'er you give the self you love when life is o'er and minos has rehearsed the grand last doom not birth nor eloquence nor what shall burst torquatus tomb not dian's self can chaste hippolytus to life recall nor theseus free his loved piritos from lethe's thrall End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book 4, Ode 8, Donarem Pateras, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org, by Ross Clayt, March 30th, 2K16, Roebuck, South Carolina. Donarem Pateras ah kensorinas to my comrades true rich cups rare bronzes gladly would i send choice tripods from olympia on each friend would i confer choicer on none than you had but my fate such gems of art bestowed as cunning scopus or paratius wrought this with the brush that with the chisel taught to image now a mortal now a god but these are not my riches your desire such luxury craves not and your means disdain a poet's strain you love a poet's strain accept and learn the value of the lyre not public gravings on a marble base whence comes a second life to men of might e'en in the tomb not hannibal's swift flight nor those fierce threats flung back into his face not impious carthage in its last red blaze in clearer light sets forth his spotless fame who from crushed afric took away a name 
than rude calabria's tributary lays let silence hide the good your hand has wrought farewell reward had blank oblivion's power dimmed the bright deeds of romulus at this hour despite his sire and mother he were naught thus aeacus has scaped the stygian wave by grace of poets and their silver tongue henceforth to live the happy isles among no trust the muse she opes the good man's grave and lifts him to the gods so hercules his labours o'er sits at the board of jove so tyndareus offspring shine as stars above saving lorn vessels from the yawning seas so bacchus with the vine wreath round his hair gives prosperous issue to his votary's prayer end of poem this recording is in the public domain Book Four, Ode Nine, Ne Forte Credas, by Horace, translated by John Connington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, March thirtieth, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Ne Forte Credas. Think not those strains can e'er expire, which cradled mid the echoing roar of Alphidus to latium's lyre i sing with arts unknown before though homer fill the foremost throne yet grave stasicorus still can please and fierce alcaeus holds his own with pindar and simonides the songs of teos are not mute and sappho's love is breathing still she told her secret to the lute and yet its chords with passion thrill not sparta's queen alone was fired by broidered robe and braided dress and all the splendours that attired her lover's guilty loveliness not only teucer to the field his arrows brought nor ilion beneath a single conqueror reeled nor crete's majestic lord alone or sthenelus earned the muses crown not hector first for child and wife or brave Deiphobus laid down the burden of a manly life before atreides men were brave but ah oblivion dark and long has locked them in a tearless grave for lack of consecrating song twixt worth and baseness lapped in death what difference you shall ne'er be dumb while strains of mine have voice and breath the dull neglect of days to come those hard-won honours shall not blight no lolius no a soul is yours clear-sighted keen alike upright when fortune smiles and when she lowers to greed and rapine still severe spurning the gain men find so sweet a consul not of one brief year but oft as on the judgment seat you bend the expedient to the right turn haughty eyes from bribes away or bear your banners through the fight scattering the foeman's firm array the lord of boundless revenues salute not him as happy no call him the happy who can use the bounty that the gods bestow can bear the load of poverty and tremble not at death but sin no recreant he when called to die in cause of country or of kin translator's note twixt worth and baseness lapped in death what difference i believe i have expressed horace's meaning though he has chosen to express himself as if the two things compared were dead worthlessness and uncelebrated worth by fixing the epithet sepultae to inertiae he doubtless meant to express that the natural and appropriate fate of worthlessness was to be dead buried and forgotten but the context shows that he was thinking of the effect of death and its consequent oblivion on worth and worthlessness alike and contending that the poet alone could remedy the undiscriminating and unjust award of destiny throughout the first half of the ode however horace has rather failed to mark the transitions of thought he begins by assuring himself and by implication those whom he celebrates of immortality 
on the ground that the greatest poets are not the only poets he then exchanges this thought for another doubtless suggested by it that the heroes of poetry are not the only heroes though the very fact that there have been uncelebrated heroes is used to show that celebration by a poet is everything or bear your banners through the fight scattering the foeman's firm array it seems on the whole simpler to understand this of actual victories obtained by lolius as a commander than of moral victories obtained by him as a judge there is harshness in passing abruptly from the judgment seat to the battlefield but to speak of the judgment seat as itself the battlefield would i think be harsher still end of poem this recording is in the public domain book four ode eleven est mihi nonum by horace translated by john conington read for librivox dot org by sonia est mihi nonum here is a cask of alban more than nine years old here grows green parsley phyllis and good store of ivy too wreathed ivy suits your hair you know the plate shines bright the altar strewn with vervain hungers for the flow of lambkin's blood there's stir among the serving folk they bustle bustle boy and girl the flickering flames send up the smoke in many a curl but why you ask this special cheer we celebrate the feast of ides which april's month to venus dear in twain divides oh tis a day for reverence even my own birthday scarce so dear for my Maecenas counts from thence each added year. Tis Telephus that you'd bewitch, but he is of a high degree, bound to a lady fair and rich. He is not free. O oh, think of Phaeton half burned, and moderate your passion's greed. Think how Bellerophon was burned by his winged steed. So learn to look for partners meet, shun lofty things, nor raise your aims above your fortune come then sweet my last of flames for never shall another fair enslave me learn a tune to sing with that dear voice to music care shall yield its sting end of poem this recording is in the public domain book four o twelve jam veris comites by horace Translated by John Conington. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Jam veris comites. The gales of Thrace that hush the unquiet sea, Spring's comrades on the bellying canvas blow. Clogged earth and brawling streams alike are free From winter's weight of snow. Wailing her itis in that sad, sad strain, Builds the poor bird, reproach to after time, Of Secrop's house for bloody vengeance taken on foul barbaric crime the keepers of fat lambkins chant their loves to sylvan reeds all in the grassy lea and pleasure him who tends the flocks and groves of dark-leaved arcady it is a thirsty season virgil mine but would you taste the grape's calenian juice client of noble youth to earn your wine some nard you must produce a tiny box of nard shall bring to light the cask that in sulpician cellar lies oh it can give new hopes so fresh and bright and glad and gloomy eyes you take the bait then come without delay and bring your ware be sure tis not my plan to let you drain my liquor and not pay as might some wealthy man come quit those covetous thoughts those knitted brows think on the last black embers while you may and be for once unwise when time allows tis sweet the fool to play End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Book four, ode thirteen, Audivere Lique, by Horace, translated by John Conington, read for LibriVox.org by Ross Clayton, March thirty first, two K sixteen, Roebuck, South Carolina. Audivere Lique. The gods have heard, the gods have heard my prayer. Yes, Lyke, you are growing old, 
and still you struggle to look fair you drink and dance and trill your songs to youthful love in accents weak with wine and age and passion youthful love he dwells in kia's cheek and hears her harp-strings move rude boy he flies like lightning o'er the heath past withered trees like you you are wrinkled now the white has left your teeth and settled on your brow your cohen silks your jewels bright as stars ah no they bring not back the days of old in public calendars by flying time enrolled where now that beauty where those movements where that color what of her of her is left who breathing love's own air me of myself bereft who reigned in kinara's stead a fair fair face queen of sweet arts but fate to kinara gave a life of little space and now she cheats the grave of like spared to raven's length of days that youth may see with laughter and disgust a firebrand once ablaze now smouldering in grey dust end of poem this recording is in the public domain book four ode fourteen quae cura patrum by horace translated by john conington Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Quae cura patrum. What honors can a grateful Rome, a grateful Senate, Caesar, give to make thy worth through days to come emblazoned on our records live? Mightiest of chieftains, whomsoever the sun beholds from heaven on high. They know thee now, thy strength in war, those unsubdued Vindelici. Thine was the sword that Drusus drew, when on the Brunian hordes he fell, and stormed the fierce Genonian crew, even in their alpine citadel, and paid them back their debt twice told. Twas when the elder Nero came to conflict, and in ruin rolled, stout Ratian Curnus of giant frame. Oh, it was a gallant sight to see the shocks that beat upon the brave who chose to perish and be free. As south winds scorch the rebel wave, when through rent clouds the pleiads weep, so keen his force to smite, and smite the foe, or make his charger leap through the red furnace of the fight. Thus Daunia's ancient river fares, proud Orphidus with bull-like horn, when swollen with choler he prepares a deluge for the fields of corn. So Claudius charged and overthrew the grim barbarian's mail-clad host the foremost and the hindmost slew and conquered all and nothing lost the force the forethought were thine own thine own the gods the selfsame day when port and palace open throne low at thy footstool egypt lay that selfsame day three lustres gone another victory to thine hand was given another field was won by grace of caesar's high command these spanish tribes unused to yield mead indian sith that knows no home acknowledge sought at once and shield of italy and queenly rome ister to thee and tanais fleet and nile that will not tell his birth to thee the monstrous seas that beat on britain's coast the end of earth to thee the proud iberians bow and gauls that scorn from death to flee the fierce cygambrian bends his brow and drops his arms to worship thee end of poem this recording is in the public domain book four ode fifteen phoebus valentum by horace translated by john connington read for LibriVox .org by joe blue Phoebus Valentum, of battles fought I fain had told, and conquered towns when Phoebus smote. His harp string soothed, twere overbold to tempt white seas in that frail boat. Thy age, great Caesar, has restored to squalid fields the plenteous grain. 
given back to Rome's almighty lord. Our standard torn from Parthian fane has closed Kyrenian Janus gate, wild passions erring walk controlled, heal the foul plague spot of the state, and brought again the life of old, life by whose healthful power increased. The glorious name of Latium spread to where the sun illumes the east, from where he seeks his western bed. While Caesar rules, no civil strife shall break our rest, nor violence rude, nor rage that wets the slaughtering knife and plunges wretched towns in feud. The sons of Danube shall not scorn the Julian edicts, no, nor they. By Tenes distant river born, nor Persia, Scythia, or Cathay, and we on feast and working tide, while Bacchus bounties freely flow, our wives and children at our side, first paying heaven the prayers we owe, shall sing of chiefs whose deeds are done, as wont our sires to flute or shell, and Troy, and Chises, and the son of Venus on our tongues shall dwell. End of recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Carmen Seculare by Horace Translated by John Conington Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Carmen Seculare Phoebe Silvarumque Phoebus and Diane, huntress fair, Today and always magnified, Bright lights of heaven accord our prayer this holy tide, on which the Sibyl's volume wills that youths and maidens without stain to gods who love the seven dear hills should chant the strain. Sun that unchanged yet ever new leads out the day and brings it home may not be present to thy view more great than Rome. Blessed Elysia, be thou near in travail to each Roman dame. Lucina, Genitalis, hear, whatever thy name. O oh, make our youth to live and grow, the father's nuptial counsel speed, those laws that shall on Rome bestow a plenteous seed. So when a hundred years and ten bring round the cycle game and song, three days, three nights shall charm again the festal throng. Ye too, ye fates, whose righteous doom, declared but once, is sure as heaven, Link on new blessings yet to come to blessings given. Let earth with grain and cattle rife crown Sarah's brow with wreath and corn. Soft winds, sweet waters, nurse to life the newly born. O lay thy shafts, Apollo, by, let suppliant youth obtain thine ear. Thou moon, fair regent of the sky, thy maidens hear. If Rome is yours, if Troy's remains, Safe by your conduct, sought and found, Another city, other fanes, on Tuscan ground, For whom, mid fires and piles of slain, Aeneas made a broad highway, Destined pure heart with greater gain, Their loss to pay. Grant to our sons unblemished ways, Grant to our sires an age of peace, Grant to our nation power and praise, And large increase. See, at your shrine, with victims white, Praise Venus and Anchises' heir. O oh, prompt him still the foe to smite, the fallen to spare. Now Media dreads our Alban steel, our victories land and ocean over. Scythia and Ind in suppliance kneel, so proud before. Faith, honor, ancient modesty, and peace and virtue, spite of scorn, come back to earth, and plenty see with teeming horn. Augur and lord of silver bow, Apollo, darling of the nine, who heals our frame when languor slow hath made it pine. Lovest thou thine own palatial hill? Prolong the glorious life of Rome to other cycles brightening still through time to come. From Algidus and Aventine, list, goddess, to our grave fifteen, to praying youth thine ear incline, Diana, queen. Thus Jove and all the gods agree, so trusting went we home again. Phoebus and Diane singer we, and this our strain. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of the Odes and Carmen Seculare by Horace.
Translated by John Conington.